Um, okay, Drizoth, as I pull up your Twitter here uh, to give people an idea of what you have been posting, can you tell me what has been your goal with uh, with this experiment that you're doing on Twitter? Um, and what are you? What have you been looking at? So my idea was quite simple. It's very common in like games, uh, not just card games, but I think card games are worse about it, for people to basically say the devs have no idea what they're doing. They don't know how to balance this game. This problem is obvious. What the hell is wrong with them? Why can't they balance their game? And at the start of this patch, I wanted to get back into doing some tableau work, some stats work. I was like, why don't I just pretend to be a balance dev? Say, pretend I have all of the control and try and balance two weeks out, as they say they have to, and see, are these things really so easy? Are the devs really so clueless? Um, and I've been going through it. I pulled the data from Balco, who uh, I don't think you tend to use his site, but he's one of the other data sites. Makes a comparable site to Legna. Yeah, I usually use um, Legna, but I've seen the other one for sure. Yeah, they're pretty compar comparable in terms of their products. So I use his data set. I load it into Tableau and I take a look at it and try and figure out is there some problem that the uh, devs are just somehow missing? Is there something that really should be acted on as a hot fix or something? Okay. Okay. I, I think that's pretty reasonable, right? Because a lot of people do want to backseat a uh, game dev without putting in the work, right? Um, so the fact that you're looking at stats and trying to look at the same information ostensibly that they're looking at to decide, you know, if there should be balance changes and if so, what they should be. Um, I, I think that's cool. I think that's cool. Um, but yeah, uh, tell me, uh, so how do I, how do I look at the same stats you're looking at? You said Balco, you said you put in like a Tableau. How do I access that? Is there a way, easy way? So I can yeah, I, I have it loaded in a website. I mean, you'll probably run into it. It'd be above that tweet. You linked it somewhere. I think I remember yeah. seeing it. You're scrolling past it at this point, but. If you go up, that one. It has a really boring thumbnail because Tableau is yeah. not supposed to. How am I going to want to click privilege. on it with a thumbnail like that? Come on. Yeah, I can't actually edit the thumbnail, and it looks atrocious. I'm not going <laughs> to tell you otherwise. Okay. So you're looking at this, and I, I think that the big one that I see you point to every single day, every day I wake up, um, well, it's not when I wake up, but I am scrolling through Twitter and I see Drizoth's tweet. And I'm like, okay, Drizoth thinks that Demasi is an issue and that Yordlin Arms isn't a big deal. Um, can you tell me what we're looking at to come to those conclusions? So the easy way to understand this graph is the left hand graphs, the one that's listed as win rate time decay. This is each archetype. It's 25 archetypes. There's a parameter on the right that we'll get to in a bit. It's 25 archetypes and then an other field that you can see in the bottom right-hand corner. And each dot is placed at its win rate, weighted by time. It cares more about what's been going on recently than what's going on in the past, but it's a lot of math and doesn't really matter. So, but and it's meta share. This patch, right? Correct. This okay. patch. Okay. You can see so it goes back to like a little bit before April 1st. When it's weighted by time decay, that means that like uh, stats from today are uh, more important to this than like stats from five days ago. Correct, but okay. nothing ever drops off. Nothing doesn't count other than not this patch. It just decays it away until um, it doesn't matter. Okay. So so when I'm looking the, at this and I'm like, what's the highest win rate? Obviously, it's, uh, it looks like scouts um, with like a relatively low play rate. Um, correct. Whereas like, you know, if we come a little bit further over, Riven Victor has a slightly lower win rate, but a significantly higher play rate, right? So correct. we're looking at these and trying to uh, come to conclusions from this, like what might be too OP, what's getting too much play, what needs to be changed. Yeah, something cool about this graph that I actually do look on is if you click on the Misfortune Quinn dot. Mm -hmm. So if you can click on it. Yep, it shows. The loser rate time decay is the matchup spread for this deck. Yeah. So Misfortune Quinn is beating up Fizzifelios, Timo Caitlin other stuff and sun disc so you can see all the matchups so yeah. it's like also worthwhile as a balance step of being like okay is yordles and arms pushing away all of these decks that people like because 
people care about that. Like, it's like, if you can't play your fun, cool decks, you just have to play um, like these very specific counters. That's not very fun either. And you might want to take action. Okay. Okay. For sure. And I, I know that I definitely have used this site in the past to find like matchup tables and um, things like that. So it is really cool. It's a cool functionality. Um, yeah. So if we look at like Fizz Lulu, for instance, uh, it looks like it's crushing a Zira Irelia. Poor Zira Irelia. <laughs> isn't that, isn't that, um, that feels like a good thing, right? You know, that it's crushing like, like, like a Zira Irelia. Yeah. I mean, people really don't like a Zira Irelia. So um, mm. I think it's like probably kind of healthy at this point, but people yeah. do not like it. I think if, if it's being kept out of the meta by Yordlin Arms, I mean, I mean, it's a good thing. Maybe we should keep Yordlin Arms just completely, you know, unnerved. That's kind of based, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, talk to me then. What are we looking at with Fizz Lulu that you're thinking this deck isn't really an issue, or if it is an issue, it's not the Yordlin Arms side? Because it feels like that's the take that you've been having. Yeah, that's something that I alluded to earlier in terms of the nuance. I don't I do think Yordlin Arms, the deck, is a problem. I don't really think that Yordlin Arms, the card, is the problem in the deck. So the reason for this is Fizz Lulu uh, is like breaching 55% win rates. It's probably overplayed by weaker players because a weak, the stronger players seem to be exploring other stuff going on. So this deck seems to have a concerning win rate. It continues to be breaching this 55% that um, Riot has talked about being their benchmark for potentially taking action. Okay. Now, this meta and also Yordlin Arms, things have calmed down. Previous meta Yordlin Arms is like cracking 60%, which is just absurd win rates. You need to nerf this. Mm -hmm. There's no question. Now it gets a lot more complicated because it's not so far beyond this 55 percent um i think the yeah, if you look at ar really stats high. i think it's a little higher but uh -huh. it, is is this polling just from like masters or is it plot plus or diamond plus do we know it's masters ish you can get a uh like a diamond player playing a masters player and the diamond player will be included but uh -huh. it doesn't specifically include diamond players gotcha gotcha i think that uh i think the like front page of runeter ar um, it's like plat plus or something, right? Something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, I, I think that looking at these stats, um, and looking at like other stats, you know, if we look at like rune terror AR or, you know, we just look at this, it, it feels like for how high of a play rate it has, it does have a very high win rate. Um, and it's the type of deck that's been around for a long time. Um, do you feel like. But what what are we looking at to decide that it's not the card Yordlin Arms? It might be you know like Chompers or just like discard uh, synergies in general. Yeah. So the reason that I started looking at other stuff is you see many other decks that are using kind of uh, this boom ba boom discard package and have high win rates. None of them look quite. None of them look as problematic as uh, Yordlin Arms the deck. I'm not going to deny that or anything. But you see stuff like Riven Victor with a persistently high win rate. It's been in the territory of concerning. Riven Victor doesn't use Boom Boom Boom, though, right? Some do. Not all, but some. Um, you see Draven Rumble. Draven Rumble on a couple of days has been um, above 55%. Who, I, I've, I've never seen it use Boom Boom Boom. But yeah, Draven Rumble actually, is definitely... Uh, I have looked into this because it came up on Twitter. A couple, some Riven Victor lists, I think it's like a quarter of them okay. run some number of Boom Baboons. It's spread across all number. Okay. But okay. you see stuff like um, the, like, Aphelios P and Z decks. Floppy Mudkip is the major propo like proponent of playing Boom Baboon in that deck. But yeah, and this is more there. tempo, for sure. Yeah. You've seen the 4LW. Uh, Essentially, mono P and Z Phi deck playing uh, Boom Baboon. Okay. It shows up like fairly consistently in these P and Z decks trying to uh, like do them. And it's kind of been like hanging around uh, in various P and Z 
decks previously propping stuff up. I mean, even going back all the way to like uh, Lulu Jinx, the stolen conch special. Yeah, I, Lulu I mean, Jinx, you know, Draven Ezreal, um, you know, Sion, Draven Ezreal. Like yeah. it, it's Boom Baboon is a very strong card. I don't think anybody can disagree with that. And I think that like the discard synergy of being able to get a body plus, um, you know, discard target that generates chompers. I think chompers is incredibly strong, right? Um, I, I don't think that's arguable at all for sure. Yeah. Um, so I kind of wonder is like previous meta, it made a lot more sense to me to argue that your own arms, the card was an issue because we also had this like Demacia, Fey pile that played Yordles in arms and rallied on you and killed you. Mm -hmm. And that deck was silly. And so it kind of looked like Yordle in arms, the card was an issue. Because we have two distinct Yordle in arms decks that just kind of played units and Yordles in arms to you, and that was apparently good enough to win games. But that deck is dead. Like, people played it for a little bit and had sub 50% win rates, sub 45 most it. of the time. Where can we see stats on it? Because I know nobody's playing it, but I've talked to like Gouda, and Gouda. Um, one of like the better players on it, you know, was top of ladder last season with it. Um, you know, I he don't just talked about how he doesn't feel or he feels like it's still pretty solid. Um, it's seeing a little bit of tournament play. Um, so I'm just wondering. But yeah, it's seeing like zero ladder play, right? Yeah, I don't have uh, easily available stats. I did look it up at one point. The win rate on this deck is atrocious. It was heavily played right at the start of patch, and then it completely fell off. But for most of the time period that we've been post patch, it has been sub forty five percent win rate, which is well and truly like unplayable. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Right? Like, like even really shitty decks, you know, usually pull like 50 percent, right? Yeah, I mean, the only time I've seen a deck show up on my graph that was worse than forty five percent was like Udir Akshan Howling Abyss, which sounds very close to unplayable. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I, I definitely could see that. Um, so I, I guess my question would be when I'm looking at something like uh, the discard package within um, within PNZ, uh, I feel like it, it is definitely very strong. Um, and it's something that is, you know, kind of propping up a lot of these different decks and making them viable. Um you know, I, I think that people have a lot less issue with, like, uh, Ari Lulu versus with uh, Lulu Fizz. Sure. Yeah, there's... So, something that's, I'm sure, very hard for the devs, and I think is very easy to gloss over when you're trying to backseat them, is to kind of look at this and be like, okay, what is the correct nerf, and what do people want nerfed? Because if you're asking about like public opinion, I think it's unquestionably you nerf your rules and arms because people hate that card. But when you're asking like what is the correct from a game balance perspective, it may not be what people want. For a good example of this, like a very clear example, if you remember the Dreadway Ledger's Timelines deck, mm -hmm. people hated that deck. That deck was also atrocious. It was never playable. It was sub 40% win rate for most of its time. Mm -hmm. But people loathed it. I, I think a similar, like more recent one is like the uh, the Karina Plaza Guardian bullshit, right? Like that's that's a deck that I, I don't know if other people bitch about it, but I bitch about it constantly. I think that even if it's bad, I don't think it's an interaction that should exist in the game. Well, I I like the Dreadway Ledros one more because they actually nerfed it for that reason. For sure. If you go read their explanations, they talk about how like yeah, they this said deck wasn't bad good. The game, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and. If you're trying to manage public opinion, which, like, your game, the game is supposed to be fun. Like, managing public opinion is a very reasonable goal. Mm -hmm. Very reasonable to just say, okay, Yordle in Arms looks to be the most problematic of these PNC discard decks. Maybe we'll have to nerf Chompers later on down the road, but we don't have to now, and people really don't like this one. So let's target and hit this one and move on with our life and revisit Chompers if it comes back up. Okay. Okay. Um, so I, so like w when I'm looking at something like Fizz Lulu, I guess I, I can see where you're coming from, that there's a lot of decks that use this boom, ba boom discard package. And obviously it's very powerful. Um, I, I think when I look at something like Fizz Lulu, um, I see a deck that has like infinite value as far as like generating a ton of units, um, and then taking those units and then making them uh, having like an, I win button with Yordle in Arms that just instantly like, trades down the entire board um, 
and just kind of makes it impossible to actually end up fighting this uh, deck, right? Um, that, that's what I see in it, which is why like, I, I feel like I would like to see it change just because I think that, again, something like Ari Lulu or Draven Rumble using these, uh, using like Boom Baboon, I, I don't have as much of an issue with that because, you know, it feels like, you know, they aren't just like auto winning the game and auto winning the board and I can't, you know, like clear out their units. Um, so I, that, that's where I come from on it, that where I would want to target like the Yordlin arm specifically. Um, but at the same time, like if you check my Twitter from, uh, you know, my wish list for this last patch, I wanted Chompers to be zero one, right? Like, I think Chompers are kind of broken. Yeah, I mean, I think like this Chompers to zero one would do a lot to help with these kind of like your arms turns because all of a sudden Whale cleans up more stuff. It's like very relevant how many X twos that deck has because X twos survive Whale and let's see your arms resolve on yeah. cards. Um, it comes back around in a couple of different ways. It's harder to set up this like uh, Lulu plus Chompers on three situation. Mm -hmm. um, a nerf that I don't know if Simon, uh, like Salty Simon, was specifically uh, alluding to, but he kind of talked about moving the Chompers from Baboon somewhere to Last Breath. I think yeah. he wanted it to come directly into play, but you can also put it into your hand. Um, and something like that makes it really difficult to get the choppers out of your baboon in time to Lulu it on turn three. For sure. Which, I don't know, maybe it introduces a pain point for this deck where it doesn't have this like very strong turn three, as well as this like obnoxious card generation in Yordles and Arms late game. But... So I think that just because the discard archetype um, very much is about uh, swarming the board as quickly as possible and being like super efficient with its... Uh, with its like unit generation, right? You know, I, I'm using my Poro Cannon and generating a unit on board at burst speed um, with that, right? Like you wanna go as wide as possible. You know, we've seen this since like Draven Jinx, um, you know, Scion decks have used this, even Draven Ezra was using this, right? Um, I think that that's like the interesting part and the cool part about it. So something like it going to last breath, I think slows down the whole archetype enough that like, I, I wouldn't necessarily be crazy about that, but it definitely makes the deck or it makes like the, the card boom baboon and i guess like the deck as a whole uh, makes it a lot uh, weaker i think yeah i mean i think this is like a very salient discussion to have with like my original goal of like can you actually backseat the devs mm -hmm. this is a hard discussion and like i don't actually think there's an objectively correct answer like well, my opinion is the correct answer every time oh, of course of course yeah yeah <laughs> no go ahead yeah, so, like, if some omnipotent being came down from the sky and told me, hey, nerfing yordles and arms was the objectively correct choice, uh -huh. you're stupid for suggesting other side. It's like, okay, well, that's fair. You're an omnipotent being or whatever. But was it actually possible for me to figure out which of these was the correct nerf beforehand? Because, I mean, we can come up with even more absurd nerfs to, like, yordles and arms. I don't know, take elusive off daring poro that probably nerfs the oh, that's deck fucked enough. up that's fucked that's up. like a bizarre nerf to make but you could just start like spitballing nerfs that technically affect this deck if you wanted to mm -hmm. i yeah i think that there's of course we i think that it's very easy for anybody to sort of like look at a deck and be like okay if we wanted to neuter this we could you know like i if i wanted to neuter mf quinn i'd be like um you know, MF is a 2-1 uh, now. It's like, okay, well, yeah, you just killed the deck. And I think that something like making Dairy Porous, you know, just not elusive, um, would definitely be on that level. Uh, I, I think that when we're looking at stats, uh, it comes back to it. It's pretty easy to identify if something's an issue, um, but, like, how to fix it is really hard. And I think that's what a lot of devs uh, go through, right? They come up with a lot of um, changes to cards or, like, fixes... Uh, to decks that I, I think a lot of people generally don't um, see, right? That's the old adage, is that uh, the community is, like, good at finding something that's wrong, but incredibly bad at deciding, like, uh, how it's wrong or, like, how to fix it, right? Yeah, that's, um, I know the quote you're referring to, it's from Mark Rosewater, who's, like, one of the primary designers of Magic, and it was, um, the community is, like, excellent at discovering when there's a problem, and just atrocious at fixing it. Yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, there's a, there's a different adage from another game developer who I don't think had any relation to Magic of, like, players will optimize the fun out of their games. Oh, players sure. will just sit there and, like, ruin games for themselves. Mm -hmm. 
yeah i've seen the uh i've seen the the uh i don't know if it's like a game con quote or something but when they're giving the uh the uh presentation on it i've seen it bam a gdc i think probably i mean that sounds like a quote that would come out of it yeah um yeah i i don't know i i think that I think when I'm when we're looking at the stats, uh, I, I definitely think that um, you know, like when I'm reading your Twitter posts, I'm like, yeah, I, I could see what you're talking about as far as like these decks are kind of an issue. Except for Demasi, I don't know if Demasi is actually an issue. Uh, I mean, you, you see this like MF Quinn, Sivaraksha, <laughs> right there up there with your hated uh, for, sure, for sure, but I I don't necessarily think it's a Demasi issue. Um, I guess that my argument. Uh, again, like we could go back to my wish list for last patch. My argument is that is Drizoth and Call. Yeah, it's something we have Drizoth and Call. Um, I uh, I think from my perspective, if you want to nerf a lot of these Demacia decks, it feels like we're not really nerfing the decks themselves. We're like just crippling Demacia, and like the decks that really get hurt by stuff like a Sharp Sight nerf um, is like Shen Jarvan or like uh, you know the Poppy Rally decks. Um, or a lot of these other Demacia decks, whereas the ones that, you know, like Pantheon or Scouts, um, care a lot less about those nerfs. It feels like we're missing the problematic decks, um, instead yeah. of hitting like Demacia as a region, which I don't think is, you know, doing that great, if that makes sense. I actually, I actually agree with you. So in most of my tweets, I say, when I talk about Demacia, I think there's a very specific problem in Demacia of the good Demacia decks are the ones that can abuse a rally. And rally is just this ridiculously overpowered card and nothing else in Demacia is good. And so like MF Quinn, Sivir Akshan, and Pantheon's gotten a little complicated because they only have one unit. They're actually using Cataclysm, not a full rally. But mm. the concept is the same. And the idea is I'm going to play Demacia deck and I'm going to abuse the crap out of rally and if I'm not doing that, Demacia isn't a good region at all. Maybe. And, I, I think Demacia is good at taking stats and like taking uh, unit stats and making them useful. Um, and I think it does it in a couple different ways through having like strike spells, you know, concerted strikes, single. Uh, these are like very strong uh, like removal spells that come from utilizing your stats and making them useful. And I think similarly, Rally is kind of integral to the game. Because right now, you know, if you have something with, like, big stats, most of the time it does not matter unless it has, like, elusive or overwhelm uh, or your opponent just, like, runs out of shit to block. And I think that, uh, I think Rally is one of the few ways to make board presence um, and make, like, these stats actually matter. So I, I would be not crazy about targeting Rally as, like, the nerf point. Yeah, so I would like to clarify my goal if I was, like, given control of Riot or whatever, and could do whatever I want. My goal would actually not be to reduce the power of Demacia as a whole at all. My goal would be to, like, shift it from Rally to the rest of the region. To basically be like, I don't know, maybe you can have Vanguard Sergeant back as a 3-4. You can, I think we can certainly put Sharpside back to plus 2, plus 2. We can give you some of this power back in other areas of your region and just not have it be like, okay, if you're playing Demacia, and you're not a rally deck, like you're probably screwing up. Mm. I I do feel like if we do take the the direction of hey, I want to nerf rally because rally seems to be like the ubiquitous thing that makes these uh Demo these current Demacia decks work. Uh, it feels like when we do that, uh, suddenly mid range decks are losing to vile feast because something like vile feast, like being able to just perma block and stop an entire turn, seems really bad from my perspective i really want rally to be something that punishes people who don't play for board um or you know uh don't like adequately protect themselves stuff like uh Freljard si i think should be losing to rally and i think rally is necessary to uh counter stuff like that and if we're getting rid of rally and we're saying okay but you can have back you know these stats again i feel like these stats don't matter without again overwhelm uh elusive or like something like rally does that make sense yeah yeah so i wouldn't like to just completely get rid of the concept of rally where it's just like okay delete relentless pursuit golden ages i don't know shampo like rally is just not a card that you're allowed to have mm -hmm. i don't think that is the solution that you should look for but i think trying to push it to stuff like uh, i mean tiana crown guard is just like 
an unbearably terrible card at this point. Oh, it's but awful. Stuff like Tiana Crown Guard, um, or like unit mana rallies, maybe just like higher spell cost mana so that they like functionally are costing you some amount of unit mana. I mean, I think the problems with rally like really came to a head with uh, Zed Poppy iteration, where it was like six rallies. They don't cost any mana. We're just going to play a million rallies because we can. And I think it's in a healthier spot now than it was, certainly. Mm -hmm. But it's cropped up in multiple metas where we have this like problematic rally or rally adjacent deck with Pantheon. And I think it's just causing consistent problems for Riot. The decks themselves are getting a little overpowered in this meta. And I think Riot will have a better time if they just kind of fix Rally, fix Damasi as a region, and move on from this problematic period. Okay. I, I definitely see where you're coming from, because, you know, if this is a mechanic that continually comes up as being, you know, abused or is in these incredibly high-tier decks, you know, I, I could see where you're coming from. It's like, you know, you can only take it for so long before it's like, okay, well, this this is a mechanic that seems to be, you know, problematic or breaking the game in its current state. Um I think counterpoint Pantheon runs like one rally right now, right? Um, well, I agree. It gets a little unclear with Pantheon because they're only running like one real rally. Sometimes I, even zero. I, I but think it's like that, I think you have like a reasonable argument against rally without bringing up Pantheon. I think Pantheon okay. just like hurts your argument. To be honest with you, because like again, Pantheon just does not use rally. Yeah, I mean that's true with like Yumi Pantheon, but prior to Yumi, when like you cared yeah, so much about a single unit, it played plenty of rallies For it's sure. only now that it cares about this like one specific unit that it moved to specifically cataclysm which is kind of a rally for one unit uh kind of i see what you're saying i think so zed poppy is an interesting deck in that um you know it was, it was a very contentious deck i think people really disliked playing against it it applied a ton of pressure uh from the get-go and like if you ever tapped out it was going to kill you right um but I, I, in my opinion, uh, the issue with Zed Poppy wasn't necessarily Rally. I, I think that Rally's like an enabler. I think that um, the issue with Zed Poppy was Twin Disciplines, making it so that you couldn't kill Zed, you couldn't kill Poppy. Um, you know, Young Witch also being like a free combat trick. It was like a combination of things that meant that you couldn't really interact with their board um, and kill them. And if you can't interact with their board and you can't kill them, then suddenly stuff like Rally is just incredibly abusive because i i think that a lot of times when rally's winning you games it's not because rally exists I, I don't think rally's the issue i think it's that you weren't able to trade down board you keep losing board presence um and then you know eventually when you fall behind on tempo then rally just takes full advantage of that and i i would prefer that we have like a more interactive game where like twin disciplines you know lets you kill poppy or kill zed and they have to be more careful with their units and more careful with their mana as opposed to you know, neutering the thing that uh, allows you to apply pressure, if that makes sense. It's like a finisher I, card, and I think that the issue is long before that, you know? I think you're... Um, I think you have a very reasonable argument. Something that I like to point out to people with this rally thing is, I think a lot of the problems with rally are from, like, this overall power creep in the game. And power creep isn't inherently wrong, but as units have gotten inherently stronger... They stick on the board longer, they have better stats, and Rally gets stronger. And like you can look back to like when we had fast speed three mana relentless pursuit. That yeah. card was absurd. That card sure. would have been absolutely ridiculous in the modern era. And because the threats were so bad back then, it wasn't a big deal. I mean, you still had Zed or whatever, but you didn't have two mana twin. You didn't have you didn't even have sharp side at that point. That was released later, right? Uh, I'm not sure. I started playing when Aphelios came out. Okay. I think Sharp Side came out later. So my, my rallies how are you were protecting this speed. Zed? My rallies were always slow speed. <laughs> and so it's like, you can have this like incredibly oppressive rally card if like the cards you're rallying with aren't that good. Sure. I, I, I get that because it's like, it, it's not, it, it's more of like a multiplier or an enabler for stronger cards like the sh the more that we have like really strong units or really strong protection for the units the more that uh aegis like lets you abuse them right that's kind of the argument yes yeah yeah it's i mean if we go back to like i don't know slamming like precious pets and house spiders into each other rally's probably fine yeah um, but 
we seem the devs seem to like this higher level of power in terms of other stuff. So perhaps we need to be balancing with this idea of we're going to have stronger threats. We're going to have stuff like Sivir. We're going to have this quick attack spell shield five power unit. Yeah, Sivir's really good. Sivir's really good. I, which is why, you know, when again, I, I'm going to keep coming back to it. Maybe I should pull it up. Um, when I was talking about like how I wanted to, you know, like my my balance wish list, right? Um, uh, a lot of people responded to this, like, where are the Demacia nerfs? Like, what are the Demacia nerfs? I feel like Demacia is an issue. How did you completely forget about Demacia? Um, and I look at stuff like this and it's like, I, I feel like people are missing at least my approach to it. I don't think you are, but I, I think that, um, when we're trying to hit like Sivir, I think we should hit Sivir, um, because Sivir is what makes that, uh, deck, uh, so hard. I, I think that if you aren't able to, um kill their units or beat them in combat, uh, then that's what makes, like, Rally an issue. And I don't think it's really a Rally issue. I think it's that Sivir's really fucking good. Um, you know, I want to hit Sivir. I want to hit Panthea. I want to hit MF. Um, I want to hit stuff like Sculptor. I think that these are, like, the really uh, problematic parts of these decks. Um, as opposed to, you know, you know, fuck Rally and fuck Rally being able to, uh, you know, sort of amplify um, these things right because like once you're able to trade into units or once you're able to remove units rally isn't an issue anymore right yeah i mean i think you're probably correct i mean maybe there is some hidden problem out there that we haven't seen because the decks are too good so nobody's exploring it. but in all likelihood you nerf the things that are abusing rally things are probably fine mm -hmm. i don't think that idea is completely unreasonable my concern would be we've seen rally crop up in these problematic decks a couple of times now are we sure it's not just Rally that's the problem? Maybe. I I just worry that if we remove Rally, don't we just end up in a world where Preliard SI is just god and completely unbeatable? Uh, I don't think it was very uh, wise for the health of the game to give them six avalanches. Oh, um, it's so fucking... And Ravine <laughs> is better avalanche, dude. Fuck Ravine. Yeah. Oh my god. So it's like, I don't know, there's been a couple of things that have come out, and I, I think it's easy to kind of backseat, but... Mm. I think they have tended the game into this more polarized direction. Having six avalanches is one. It's kind of like, okay, your deck either can beat avalanche or it doesn't beat for all your that side. Yeah. Because they have six of them. They're going to have an avalanche. Mm -hmm. And similarly, it's like, I talked about this on Twitter today, but Legion Rearguard, like if your region has a viable two, one for one, Legion Rearguard isn't that bad. If your regions don't have a viable two, one for one, Legion Rearguard is a problem where your opponent just plays it and decimates you on turn one. You're like, oh, okay. I guess well, it's I not quite a decimate, but I, I see where you're coming from, right? Like, if, if you're only playing, like, you know, one ones or something, it, it sucks for them to play something that's doing a ton of damage you on turn one and you can't, like, thermo it. You literally have to block it. And, you know, if you don't have a one man, two one, like, you know, eat shit, right? Well, like, for the best example of this, of like, uh, if you're playing Frelior Noxus, and you're not playing an aggressive deck, there is not a viable 2-1-for-1 one for, one for you. It does not exist. And why are you playing probably your Noxus, bro? Come on. Well, I think that's the reason you don't see this deck at all. Uh, it's like, wait, do you really think that's why probably your Noxus doesn't see play? Because it doesn't have a 1-mana 2-1? Yes. I think if you give him a 1-mana 2-1 that was somehow viable, I think this deck would actually see play. It really? may not be great, but I think it would see play. What is what is the probably your Noxus deck? Is that like Swain Sejuani or... I mean, Ash Nox would be like the classic old oh, Ash one. Nox. Okay, true, true, true. Um, hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, Freljord is like definitely the like crux of this problem because it's like okay, if you're playing Freljord and you're not playing an Avalanche deck, you don't. There is not a two one for one in that region. Like, it, it's not even like there is a defiable one. Freljord does not have a two one for one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it very much has weak one drops, right? Like Omen Hawk is its best one drop, and like that's, you know, it's a fucking one one, right? It doesn't trade yeah. anything. Okay. And there's been a couple of things like that. Um, Pantheon just like literally is a card where you either can interact with Pantheon in a reasonable way or you can't, and Pantheon mm -hmm. is probably not beatable. Yeah, I think um, I think there's definitely issues where some things like faded. 
inherently make like damage based removal just like not a thing. Like uh, uh, you have to be running like insane damage based removal to actually be able to kill any faded unit ever, right? And you're yeah. almost certainly trading down. Particularly with like guiding touch, where you're just like, okay. Yeah, guiding touch is cringe. <laughs> no, it's not. It's I mean, not the right. It's it's faded. Faded is insane. Things yeah, just get so big. I remember your uh, like your complaint about like okay, your opponent plays like. Uh, I don't think it was your complaint. Someone else's complaint about this, but like, you play a Zed, and if they have twin up, you have to thermo this thing for six to realistically kill you it. You literally have to. It's like float, <laughs> float, vengeance with thermo. That's the only way that you can kill through twin. Yeah. And someone pointed out, after that had been like part of public discourse, that your opponent plays Zed on three, and you play two, four white flame, and Sharpsight just blocks and eats this through twin. Like, <laughs> What on earth? <laughs> it just goes to seven toughness and eats it. It's fucking insane. Um, yeah, I I think that if we can take if we can look at a card like Vanguard Sergeant, um, Vanguard Sergeant, I think Fort Amasi is like a really strong card that sucks to main deck. And when you get it off of a good unit that you would play anyway, um, I think that makes it really good. But when we see like three, four Vanguard Sergeant, the things that it would do on turn three to like shut down attacks, uh, was like really valuable and really nuts. Um, and I think that it probably deserved a nerf. It probably did. Um, yeah. but when we look at that versus like wounded white flame doing like 10 times as much, it's like, bro, come on. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. There's something that, um, in, like, this kind of balancing thing, I wish people would spend more time. I mean, I think the devs do spend some time on this, but I wish there was more thought given to, like, what am I hoping occurs with this card? And I think these kind of, like, 8 out of 10 across the board cards, like, they're clearly broken. Where you're playing, like, Akshan, it's always an 8 out of 10. It's always a great card. Mm -hmm. But it is less frustrating to deal with than these, like, cards that are 14 out of 10 some of the time and 2 out of 10 other times. Okay. I think the best example of that is Sejuani, where, like, if you're playing a board-based deck and your opponent flips Sejuani, you just die. Like, mm. there, there's no beating Sejuani 2. Um, whereas if you're playing, like, your opponent plays Akshan, like, you very reasonably could just lose to this Akshan. Like, that card's insane. But it's this kind of more consistent experience where Akshan's always good and he's not that absurd you can, like, kind of handle him in a lot of games. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, like, a more pleasant experience, and I wish we tried to get more consistent 8 out of 10s and less, like, I'm playing Wounded White Flame. If you have, like, Equinox in your deck, I am super sad, and this card doesn't do anything at all. But if you're not playing Equinox and you're trying to play for the board, this card is just not beatable in the slightest. I, I could see that. I could see that. Yeah. Uh, in Sejuani is interesting. We're like Sejuani very much like is a specific counter to specific deck types, but at the same time, I see a lot less. So, like a, a comparison, I think would be Scion. I think Scion was doing a very, very, very similar thing to Sejuani, um, where when he would come down on turn seven, flipped. If your opponent's board base, they can never attack ever again, ever again, because if you attack into him, he just dies and rallies, and then you take like twelve to face. Right. Yeah, I would 100% agree that Cyan was a lot of this, because Cyan basically said, like, are you playing Ionia for bounces? Are you playing Ionia for stuns? Are you playing Targon for obliterates? Or are you playing Battle for Minimorph? Yeah. Those three regions are allowed to answer me, and everything else, get fucked, you die. <laughs> yeah. I, and I think, that, I think that there's a different perception where something like Cyan shutting down the board and killing you and applying, like, a ton of pressure is really... Uh, it's really difficult to deal with and it feels really bad. Versus like Sejuani. Sejuani kind of like slowly kills you over like five turns, ah, right? Another, another one. one. Why are there so Yo, many? Yo, Tuna too good. Thanks so much for the Prime. I really appreciate it, bud. So like, I, I think that's where like they do similar things, but the way they go about doing it and like, um, you know, how quickly they're pressuring you, I think matters. Um, and like, it is kind of why, you know, Sejuani being OP is kind of like, you know, it's like a, it's like a murmur here and there. Um, but it's never really brought up versus like Scion just being like, fuck Scion, bro. Yeah, I mean, I don't really think Sejuani is overpowered at this point. Maybe you could make that argument back when Plunder was. Uh, the, like, yeah, but that wasn't really Sejuani. Was. That was gangplank. That was it definitely wasn't, It wasn't really even gangplank. It was Crackshot Corsair. 
Crackshot yep. Corsair and Make It Rain enabling Gangplank to be flipped on turn five, right? Yeah. I'm not a huge fan of Crackshot Corsair being a 1 2. Oh, it's that so was a buff. Up. I don't know if you're aware. Yeah, it's so <laughs> fucked up. It used to be a 1 1, didn't it? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, no, it, I. It was admittedly terrible then, so. I hate 1 drops fun. with 2 health. That, that's, that's my hot take, bro. I fucking hate 1 drops with text that have 2 health. Like Saga Seeker, Cra uh, Crackshot Corsair. I should be able to thermo everything that has text on the turn it comes down. That's my hot take. Yeah, Saga, Saga Seeker is uh, uh, that is a card that is worth at least one mana. <laughs> that card, that card, it's, it's okay, you know. It's I mean, especially with the like Yumi. I don't know. You've probably had this experience because you play enough for Terra where your opponent plays Saga Seeker on one. Your opponent Yumi's it on turn three, and the Saga Seeker like gets a Sunlight Blade on turn four, and you were just getting absolutely beat to death by a one drop. Yeah. And it's, like, not close. Like, your board, like, you have a four drop that's, like, half the size of their one drop. Like, what? Yeah, I, I played, like, 45 hours of Scout straight on ladder. Um, and I feel like I played the exact same Pantheon game, like, 15 or 20 times. Where, like, they just, they drop, you know, one faded unit, whether it's the fucking Saga Seeker on one or White Flame on three. And then they just, like, Yumi it. And it's like, why am I dead on turn five? What's up with that? That's kind of weird. Um yeah. Yeah, it just shuts shit down so quickly, right? Yeah, I think that's like kind of a, like a smaller version of this like issue of like, I wish we spent more time thinking about like, is this actually an enjoyable thing to have around? Because like, mm -hmm. I think Taric Pantheon, Pantheon still was kind of miserable. I really do not enjoy any of the games that Pantheon brings to the table. But I thought that deck was significantly more enjoyable than Yumi Pantheon that just says like, I'm doing the exact same thing every game and I have no respect for anything else. Like I'm going to make one unit and I'm going to make it the size of the moon and I'm going to pray to Jesus Christ himself. You don't have combat. Yeah. I, I think one thing that was really nice about the Tarek version was that Tarek is a four mana unit that requires you to like pre-commit mana in order for him to be useful, right? You know, you're wanting to commit like pale or guiding on the turn. He comes down to get like an extra draw. Um, you're pre-committing stuff into combat, um, and if you rally, you're committing like a lot of mana ahead of time, and you're like asking to be countered. And I think that that inherently makes it a lot easier to deal with. You know, if they try to rally Pantheon or they try to rally Tark, and I like palm him or I mini morph him, then like they're just crying, right? And I feel great about that, and it feels like there's counterplay to it. Um, yeah, there's a rant uh, from a commentator in Magic that I really. Um, I come back to a lot because I think it's a very informative rant. Anyways, to kind of like get this to the salient point, he's complaining about a card that's a four mana 2-2 two -two that when it comes into play just vengeance is something, which is actually reasonable in Magic. That would be like ridiculous in Runeterra, but yeah. Magic, that's fine. And we've seen the equivalent of that card a couple of times uh, throughout Magic, where like it's not the exact same card, but it does similar things. There's been one that was a lot more similar to like uh, Tribeam, where it was a four mana, four two, that when it came into play, it did four damage to something. So the idea is like, you play this, you kill something, you get a unit. Interesting card. Okay. And the problem that he had was it was like, this card is so incredibly agnostic to what's going on. It is just pure value. It doesn't care what your opponent is doing. It's not like a damage-based removal where it cares about like, does my opponent have barrier? Does my opponent have large toughness with, like, formidable units? doesn't care about any of that. It just kills something and doesn't care. And he described it as just kind of like, I don't think this card is going to be, like, super overpowered or anything. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be good, but it's just going to be boring. Where it's like, we want this, like, drama and risk where people play, like, big units and just hope to untap. Where it's like, I want to play my expensive card and not be rewarded with this immediate burst of like value or um, I get a positive exchange where I want to play like, um, I guess for like Legends for Terror examples, I want to play like, want to play like Karma. Levy would actually be a better one. I want to play this card that I play and I'm looking to try and get to the next turn. And there's mm. actual ways for me to get punished. If I'm just playing this card that is unpunishable and doesn't have as much reward when it isn't punished, it's just kind of boring. It may be balanced objectively, but 
we want this like drama and risk and excitement from game to game of like sometimes you play your levy and it gets equinoxed and that's really bad and sometimes you play your levy and it just runs away with the game and that's great and like you want that okay so do you what, what kind of cards do you feel like like, like if we're going to take that and try to apply that to um lor what side what, what kind of cards do you feel like are that where you know you're having like zero risk and you know there's less uh excitement in it it's just like generically good all the time um and it's just like boring I, I think that's what you're getting at yeah um i mean i think like the like biggest widespread issue is like this prevalence of quick attack on champions of like okay. we want your champion to come down and just immediately attack and like never have any risk attacking okay. and it's like i mean i know you're a big fan of caitlin but like what if Caitlyn had some compensation? She puts I was like a fan four... of Caitlyn because she's really, really good. Okay. <laughs> well, what if we actually try and keep her power level the same? Like, okay. I'm not trying to nerf her anything, but she's a three-three without quick attack, but puts four flash bombs in your opponent's deck on strike or something. Okay. I'm giving you some power back, but I'm saying like this card isn't riskless. You don't just get to like play it and attack every time. Mm -hmm. like, sometimes your opponent will play like, I mean, Vanguard Sergeant no longer exists, but sometimes your opponent will be like. Vanguard Sergeant, I can just block even into your Static Shock, or well, Static Shock wouldn't occur in three, but something like yeah, I, I get which what you're saying. Block. Yeah. Um, but I'm giving you a reward for it, and sometimes your opponent won't have anything that profitably blocks Caitlyn, and she just attacks twice, puts eight flash bombs in your opponent's deck, and they can never develop anything on board. Okay. So, I, I think a lot of what makes Caitlyn or I, I guess I, I think in like from a from a generic like f let me think for a second. I think in Legends of Runeterra, um, the the idea is that you they want you to be able to play down champions and play down units and have them do cool things and like stick around and you know be uh, impactful on board for like a long time. I, I think that's the reason that we don't have you know like Doomblade in. Uh, legendary yeah. tower, right you know our removal is inherently kind of bad so that you can uh more index into your champions doing cool things um i think giving quick attack is an easy way for a champion to be pretty safe um but also not just safe but also they interact with your opponent and go into combat because i think that's another facet is that uh riot wants legends of runeterra to be like a combat focused game or they want you to at least engage with the the combat step you know, they don't want backline champions that never do anything. You know, if Caitlyn was like a, you know, a 3-3 that just generated two uh, flash bombs in your opponent's uh, deck every turn, like that would be much more boring and, you know, a lot less fun to interact with, right? I, I do think quick attack champions are a uh, much healthier way of solving so this, many? like, uh, oh, maybe are much like healthier than, like, true. Some... Sorry, go ahead. It's okay. Um... I think it's a much healthier than having true backline because like what meta was it where we just had like, so I think it's kind, of like why, it's kind of like how Aphelios, why Aphelios doesn't have quick attack. Right. Yes. Yeah. But we've had like a couple of metas that I guess like probably the one, I mean, I refer to this meta way too much, but like the TF is Aphelios meta where you have like mm -hmm. Aphelios, TF and Zoe that like, never attacked. I mean, bad players would attack with their Zoe and get it hushed and die. Yeah, but like, yeah. That meta was just like, I'm going to sit this like champion on my bench and never attack. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, it was so bad where like champions would refuse to attack. Um, yeah. And I, I think that's definitely like bad for the game. It's kind of like, um, I don't, like backline champions are kind of bad for the game and they're like uninteractive, especially if they're win conditions, you know, like Zoe or even, you know, do you remember when Azir was like considered the issue in Azir Irelia? Cause you play like a one five yeah. that just can never be fucking killed by anything. The only thing that trades evenly in the entire game is like calling strike. Right. Yeah. And like, you have to kill it. Had, if you don't kill it, had, you just lose. And they had plus three shape stone at that time. So, Oh my God. Dude, <laughs> just that's you like, also, they just they had so many recalls and dude, oh my god, I, <laughs> Azir I really I don't miss it. Even though I was playing Draven Ezreal at the time, I still fucking hated that matchup. It was just if you didn't have the answer 
on curve. It's just like, you know, you just fucking... Anyway, I, I, I think that if the alternative is that we're giving these units quick attack um, so that they want to go into combat and you're able to engage with them, um, I think that that's like a reasonable approach to it. You know, I think that's might, might be like a necessary evil, you know, similar to like Draven. Um, I get that we nerfed him to a 3-2, and that's probably good for the game, right? Because he was just like generically good as a 3-3, and, you know, he can block even and go in and attack, but you want him to be attacking. Um, and, you know, maybe three mana 3-3s three with quick attack shouldn't exist in the game. Um, well, I think, like, um, so, like, I think quick attack is better than the, if the alternative is champions that sit on the back line. I think quick attack is better. Jin but, won't make quick attack. If Jin is quick attack, that's so antithetical to everything about his character. <laughs> I hope he's yeah, not quick attack. That attacks like he's in a pool of yeah. glasses. <laughs> like, <laughs> Unless, you know, maybe he can only attack, you know, every other attack token. <laughs> that would be very amusing. But yeah, go ahead. Sorry. But if the alternative is like quick attack or champions that sit on the back line, I'd rather have quick attack. But I'd rather have... Um, I mean, have we had any champions like this? Like Renekton. Where like Renekton wants to be attacking and doesn't just be like, I'm attacking, I'm completely safe, there's no way you can ever block this without like hush or something. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of times, I mean, Caitlyn's not as bad as like old Draven was, but there was a lot of times where like your opponent plays Draven and attacks and like you can't block this. Like you can tell yourself you can block it, but like you can chump it with a 1-1. One -one. Yeah. Yeah, no, quick attack. It, it's it's interesting. It, it's definitely very interesting because it, it does feel like Riot wants the game to, um, it wants a lot of the game to exist in the combat step, right? And I think the decks that don't engage with the combat step are kind of against that. Um, I don't know. Yeah, but I don't know. I feel like they We're keep not... producing. I feel like they keep producing champions that might interact with the combat step, but they don't functionally do. Like Pantheon attacks. But does Pantheon oh, actually Pantheon interact Pantheon. in combat? Okay. But at the same time, when we look at something like Renekton, isn't Renekton really, 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 really bad because he has to go into combat and die? He has to survive two attacks? He was good. Like, back... I mean, Shurima was, like, absurdly Wait, cracked. No, no. Time, but... <laughs> you mean, like, Shurima Overwhelm? That wasn't yeah. good because of Renekton. That was good because of fucking 6-4 uh, Ruin Runner. I mean, that's fine. Like, Renekton doing... was getting cut. No, he wasn't getting cut. Sejuani was getting cut for Shiver. Um, yes. Uh, but no, I, I think Ruin Runner is why that deck was good. I mean, absolutely. But the, like, Overwhelm, the, like, Froyer Overwhelm deck, it had yeah. always been looking for a champion. And, like, yeah, it kind of didn't care what its champion was. Like, it played random-ass champions because yeah, they kind Renekton of didn't the flip in that deck, right? Renekton was just a generic 4-4 with Challenger that, like, sometimes turned into a 6-5. Or not it's, challenger yeah. with overwhelm. Overwhelm, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I, yeah. I don't know. It, it's an interesting issue because uh, coming back to like Demacia, I think that what Demacia should be able to do is uh, flex um, combat tricks uh, to be able to get ahead on board um, and like be able to win these combats. Like I think that's the interesting part about it, um, which is why something like Sharp Sight getting nerfed, I just. I'm. I don't like that. Um, cause... I don't. Oh, go ahead. I also don't like the sharp side nerf. I felt like sharp side was like obviously broken. There's not really any denying sure, that. Sure. Sure. But I actually liked that kind of card being broken. I thought it was like relatively manageable, unlike say twin um, for a combat trick that I thought was not manageable. Twin just breaks um, the paradigm. Uh... Yeah, it That's was kind of like, one. okay, you so play, like, many? this very common situation where you're playing PNZ versus Demacia, where, like, you are you would trade Sharp Sight for Mystic Shot. Right? Yeah. So, okay, even trade. I trade my two-cost two, two spell for your two-cost spell. That's fine. Here, give me um, a second. Yo, best of all our moments. Thank you so much for the seven months. Going, ooh, woo. No, thank you so much, but I really appreciate it. Sorry. Go ahead. So it's like, I felt like that was, like, a manageable trade, whereas, like, Twin Disciplines do not have manageable traits, where it's like, you just cannot do three damage for two mana, unless you, like, have top deck, what is the card? Gotcha. gotcha. Like, yeah, and gotcha's, <laughs> gotcha's so bad. Unreliable and, like, not a very good card. Um, yeah. But it's like, 
I feel like sharp side's the type of card that we want to be broken, where it's like, okay, if sharp side's broken, that means people are trying to interact with each other. I mean, I guess like the situation where you wouldn't want it to be broken is like if people are just playing sharp side as like the shittiest brother's bond of all time. But uh -huh. um, as long as people are playing it to like protect stuff, I feel like that is implying that people are interacting. There's like combat going on or people are trying to kill units. And that's like, good. That means your game is in a good place if this card is broken. Whereas if something like, I don't know, Battle Fury is broken, that's probably not implying that your game is in a good place if people are just playing Battle Fury and killing each other. Sure, sure. You know, that, that probably is a bit more solitary. Um, you're going past each other. Right, because I think Sharp Sight's Sharp Sight's more of like a value card, whereas Battle Fury is like a you know blow you out and like win card, right? I think if you're playing for value on board, that seems like a good thing. Yeah, I mean, all of this is hard because like I'm sure you can find an Amasia deck that's problematic. I mean, there's been problematic Amasia decks in the past, and it's like okay, was Sharp Sight the issue? It's like well, okay, if Sharp Sight's good, it probably implies that we're in a good place. It doesn't mean it for sure. So yeah. maybe sharp sets an issue, but I think I don't know. I think the reason why I always had an issue with twin, um, I, I feel like I've been at the forefront, you know, ringing the bell about twin disciplines forever. You know, I I was complaining about it back when I brought Lulu Poppy to Worlds, right? Like nobody was playing Ionia, and I'm like, bro, this shit is fucking broken, and twin is not okay. Um, it, it's because it like really breaks the paradigm. It just it, it makes it so impossible to trade uh, mana efficiently into removal. Uh, and it really takes cards like Poppy or like Zed and just like amplifies them to 10. Um, yeah, it's, I don't know, I, I tell people this something frequently, but you can generally get a sense of like what your opponent is possible to do of like one mana can convert to one damage. Yeah, it's exactly. relatively easy to make that conversion and like also health. And it gets really hard when you try and convert more than one to one. And like Twin just, it's not even hard, it's just, converts two to three a hundred always a hundred percent like i i think that you know you'd mentioned it but like zed on three zed on three is such a big issue when twin disciplines has three health on it because it's like okay how do i beat this like what's what's our literal best case scenario here like we throw a sump fumes at it that trades evenly in mana and then you twin and then i like proc it you know like with, with like a poro cannon and i throw another mystic on it and that's like technically even in mana, but then we're getting blown the fuck out by like Rangers Resolve. So you have to be like pre committing a fucking huge ass thermo just because of the, the threat of being blown out by this ultra uh, efficient, you know, defensive options. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, realistically, the like solution that I always came to in that situation was play a unit and just chump this thing. It's <laughs> like, mm. just stop pretending that you're going to kill this thing with damage, which was. Yeah, but not I, the greatest the issue solution. Is once you start applying that to like Poppy as well, you know that's not really an option. You can't just like chump Poppy. Right? Yeah, Poppy, uh, Poppy has to die. Twin had problems. I actually, I, I remember right when all this twin discourse was going around, which is probably um, the like Poppy meta. But I'd like to see it just be plus two or plus like plus two on either side. Yeah. Yeah, it was like going to be a worse sharp sight, but like I was okay with that. Like, Demacia can have the best combat trick that's like blatantly the best. I'm mm -hmm. fine with that. I don't have an issue. Um, and instead, I think we nerfed the wrong side of Twin. But I I agree completely. I agree completely. Yeah, I don't know. Um, to try and circle this back around because we've gone on tangents. I I enjoy talking about balance and LOR, but um. When we're talking about stuff like these Demacia decks, I, I feel like, um, I don't know, Pantheon's fucking stupid. I think if you want to nerf like Pantheon, something like nerfing Sharpside or nerfing uh, Aegis is like the wrong way. As opposed to if we just want to like say, hey, I think that if we can interact with these units and kill these units, I think that's a better position for the meta to be in and for the game to be in. Um, and Pantheon just, like, completely invalidating damage-based removal is, like, an issue. Uh, and similarly, like, Scouts having access to, like, Sculptor uh, plus, like, Rangers Resolve suddenly makes it, like, really hard to interact with these units and you can't, like, trade down board. Um, which is why, like, I, I think that 
a, a sergeant nerf made a lot of sense. I think like a sculptor nerf is like a better nerf aimed at this deck than just like nerfing rally. Yeah, I don't know how you fix uh, like Pantheon. I mean, I think the faded mechanic is like the actual the problem with so that deck. Dumb. I mean, everything like, needs to cost more. Is like really what it comes down to. Like Saga Seeker needs to be an understated two mana unit. Uh, Dragon needs to be like four mana. Pantheon needs to be like six mana. Like, well, my problem is like you have to pay up front. I think uh, as yeah. you have to pay your premium up front to get so much extra value out of your pump spells. In my yeah. opinion, my problem is like how do you fix this at this point? Because like realistically, I think faded is kind of an unbalanceable mechanic. Because like. Mm. It's really bad against Targon because they have access to Equinox, Obliterates, Hushes, like all those kinds of stuff. It's really bad against Ionia because they have a bunch of stuff that doesn't care about it. It's kind of weak to Shadow Isles because they've got Vengeances and Ruinations. Mm -hmm. And the rest of the like the regions just have a terrible time with this mechanic. Like they cannot realistically answer it. I mean, I guess like Freljord, you could go to like uh, Frostbites, but that seems really like yeah, I, there's an issue with like frostbites and stuns in general because they don't like deal with the issue, right? They they postpone yeah. it, and if you have like another uh, another plan or another like win condition, then like that's fine. Um, that's what makes these like good stall mechanics in stuff like Lee Sin or in like control decks like FTR. You know, you have long term goals that you know stalling one or two turns works. The issue is a lot of decks. You know, if you have to, like, fight through board and, you know, your answer to Pantheon is, I stunned him one turn, you know, it's just, it's a lot less effective, right? Yeah, and, like, how do you fix this at this point? Because, like, realistically, I think some of this problem came from, like, whenever Faded was pitched and someone wasn't like, you know, maybe, maybe we shouldn't have three Faded units. Maybe you should be, like, <laughs> have, like, your Victor thing where it's, like, I've got, like, one unit that, like, scales into oblivion and this card's like really cool as my champion but like maybe we shouldn't have like saga seeker and wounded white flame and like, like having fury just like exacerbates it it's so insane yes <laughs> but like if you do any of these nerfs that like i think would get it into a healthier spot where like you nerf these faded units like pantheon is just never beating an ionia deck ever again like mm -hmm. what are you supposed to do if you're playing pantheon against a deck with palms in it and like is that like a healthy like i feel like this mechanic is almost inherently unbalanceable where like if you make it quote unquote balanced the individual games are not it's either like you're playing this strategy that gets dumpstered by faded or you're playing the strategy that dumpsters faded sure and like those are the two outcomes that you'll run into i feel you yeah it, it's hard it's definitely hard um i don't know the other thing is, like, I, I think a lot of the ways to, like, fix it kind of kill it. Um, you know, like, if, if my suggestion is just upping the cost of everything, um, you know, that probably, like, kills the deck. Or even if it doesn't, it feels so bad for the people who've already played the deck that, like, just, you know, moving it so far back, like, really sucks. Um, you know, an example of that is I think, like, Ari Cannon is probably, like, a relatively playable deck, or at least it was last season. Um, but once you play it, like, after playing um the version that was broken it just feels so bad um but like even if it's more balanced it's just it's hard right yeah there's definitely something of like i mean i think like personally i've certainly had an experience where like um i put up like stupid stupid numbers of tf fizz when it was broken and i could never get the like much more reasonable deck filthy gamer weave like showed that that deck was, like, strong. And I put up, like... I did better uh, with the broken deck than Filthy Gamer Weave. So I was like, oh, like, I'm better at TF Fizz than Filthy. I should mm -hmm. be able to play this deck. Could not play it to save my life. And I never put up a good performance with the, like, more fair, more reasonable version. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like... Once you, like, get used to this, you, like, learn all of these, like, mulligan strategies. You learn all of these, like, interaction points that are only relevant to the broken version. And then it's really hard to unlearn stuff. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I definitely feel that. Yeah. I, I you know, when, when a deck gets nerfed, like sometimes you just have to put it down for a while and then come back after enough time has passed that you don't remember what it was like before. You know, with like fresh eyes, maybe you can make it work. Um, yeah. 
I don't know. People are suggesting making faded swap. Um, so it's not like health every time. So I'm saying like the first uh, target each turn is uh, plus one attack. And the second one is like, you know, health or something like that. Or it just like swaps every other turn. I don't know. It, it's it's so hard to like balance it without it just being like, you know, a feels bad mechanic. Yeah, I mean, swapping like that sounds like an okay like change, but that sounds like just hideously complicated to understand. I mean, like, oh, it's so hard you have to, to remember. Work, right? You have to remember, like LOR players that like you released a Felios and their brains melted and they started like <laughs> making flowcharts and like this deck is literally like a circle of five guns and you can either move one or two. Yeah, like this is not is complicated. Hard, come on, counting the two is hard. <laughs> yeah, but there is a certain level of it. I know that rioters um have talked about adding like cards that have activated abilities on them you know like pay x amount of mana to do something and they're like we don't really know if we want to do that um just because you know especially for like mobile players it just becomes more difficult and um you know a certain level of like you know ease to grasp is really important that's why they wanted to make like all the felius weapons the same thing even if they're doing different power level uh things um you know have being all the same mana just makes it easier for people to really um you know grasp and engage with yeah i mean i really like elor's level of complexity i came from magic i think look, magic games sometimes rise to higher levels of complexity but i think lor like really distills it it's like it gives you a consistent good experience most games whereas magic is like very variable you'll have some good games and you'll have some just atrocious games I mean, they're still um, stuck in the fucking stone age of drawing your mana. Like, come on. <laughs> I mean, I think they're stuck with that, and they are trying to make it better, but that design is horrible. You just have to... I, I think you just have to overhaul it at this point. <laughs> yeah, they're they're trying with, like, double-faced cards, where they're either a land on one side or a spell on the other, but they're bad lands and bad spells, so it's kind of like, we're trying to smooth this out, but, like, you still get the games where, like, you start with two cards in hand because you never found a land, like, Congrats. Yeah. This was a fun game. I agree, Floppy. I, I think that stuff like uh, creating um, fleeting cards in your hand, like Ballistic Bot. Ballistic Bot's basically an activated ability, right? Um, but it, it's in a more manageable way because it creates a card in your hand. Um, yeah, I, I, I agree. I don't know. Uh, Yordle in Arms. I think we need to nerf the card. I think that right, the card, that's fair. If if we're gonna nerf Ford Amasia, I think we need to nerf your one arms. I do think that cadence was just patently absurd. Like <laughs> <laughs> nerfing Vanguard Sergeant before Yordle's arms just okay. does not make sense to me. It was <laughs> it was certainly a thing. Um yeah, um, no, it felt like I mean, I, 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 and I'll be the first one to admit. I, I played a lot of scouts. You know, I played uh, Sergeant and Sivir for a long time. I played a lot of Lux decks uh, with Sergeant. I At one point, I was like, how do I just fit nine Sergeants into my lineup? Because I just want to abuse this card. Um, I think Sergeant yet, needed a nerf. And yet, you never played Fey Rally with both Yaya and Vanguard Sergeant. Uh, did people do that? Was that the build? I don't remember I... Sergeant being in it, but... I don't think it was ever in a, in a good list. But maybe but it should have been. Whenever, whenever I thought about that, I was like, what if we just <laughs> played like six Yayas and three of them came with bodies? Yeah, it's it's certainly... I I think, you know, if, if, if I'm willing to admit that like Sergeant needed a nerf, and I think it definitely needed a nerf, um, it's just the fact that Yordle and Arms wasn't nerfed at the same time. That's 100% it. That's that's my only complaint with it. <laughs> that is definitely absurd. Um, and I definitely think the Yordle and Arms deck needs a nerf. Um, it's like borderline, just kind of, if this deck was dropped from like the ether and suddenly appeared on the scene and it was at this win, right? It's borderline just on that fact. But the fact that this deck has been problematic in previous metas it's been problematic for quite a while and people really don't like it, you should probably nerf the deck. Um, but how, I think, is a hard one. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think that a lot of, like, the, the PNZ discard um, decks are, like, kind of cool. And I think that there's something that's worth supporting. You know, stuff like Ari Lulu. 
I think is using the discard in like an interesting way. Um, or even like the Jinx Lulu decks, um, or, you know, back to like Scion or Draven Jinx, you know, I think that these are decks like worth supporting and worth including in the game. And when you start like really targeting the discard portion of this, um, you know, I, I, I worry that we hit, uh, other cool decks in the crossfire, whereas like Yordlin Arms, it feels like is a lot more abusive. Um, you know, I, I think that my initial response would be, uh, you know, let's, let's nerf like Lantern, but apparently that deck died. I think Lantern's kind of broken. Giving I mean, if you want to, turns fucking stupid. If you want to argue about Lantern being broken, like Fizz, uh, Fizz of Felios is actually the poster child now. That I deck has think been... that. I, okay, maybe. Okay, maybe I need to watch somebody play this deck. But whenever I oh. play against it, play it, uh, watch somebody else play against it, I feel like the deck doesn't do anything. So, full disclosure, mm-hmm. I had an absolutely absurd win rate for like 20 games. I hit like 95% win rate. Uh-huh. Absolutely ridiculous. My win rate then dropped off a cliff. I believe my overall win rate is like 60% at this point, which like if you consider that I started at 90%, I was like sub 50%. Mm-hmm. The win rate of other people on the deck has gone up. And now it's like a 55-ish percent win rate. So I have no idea what's going on with this deck. I thought it was broken. Everybody thought it was trash. Then I thought it was bad, and like people had figured out how to counter it. And everybody else figured out that it was broken. And I have no idea what's going on with this deck anymore. It's weird in the like I, I think it's a deck that gets a lot of points for your opponent just not knowing what you're doing. You know, the first time that you slap like the double attack on Fizz, and they're like, oh fuck. Right. Or, you know, they just go like ultra wide and they just like beat you down and outvalue you. And it's like, oh, you know, maybe I need to kill this uh this lantern or this Aphelios on site. Um you know, I think there's a lot of points when you don't know what's going on. I feel like once you figure it out, it's very similar to like uh like Victor Rumble. Or not Victor Rumble, Victor Riven. Where like there's uh, there are some broken things being done here, but I think that once you know what's going on, it's a lot easier to deal with and I think it loses points. Um Fizzifelius. Yeah. It's just it feels so awkward. I think it does less unfair things than like Riven Victor. Um, where like Riven Victor sometimes can like just create like three or four huge threats that have to be answered in one turn, and like they tax you in such a way that's like, oh, uh, there's no way I was beating this. Yeah, there's definitely something to be said for like these decks. I mean, um, no slight to Faint. Faint is actually a very good player. Uh, I'm not <laughs> trying to imply that he's a bad player. But Faint definitely has a propensity for spiking Duranko and Masters with, like, these elusive cheese decks that are insane for, like, the first week. Yeah. Um, the I, man is quite good. Ambush is a Faint card. And, like, yes. if, if you see Faint in in week one, just assume he's going to ambush a fucking bot at your face. Like, just... Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, like, the... I mean, prior to, like, oh, Ambush great. being everywhere, do you remember, like, the, like, Noxus Fizz decks they yeah, always the play? Yeah, the like, with, like, Fizz, he's, like, Blade. Oh. Thor- Played, uh, elixir of wrath like 11 you <laughs> it's so fucking cringe dude <laughs> yeah no i feel you um but th- which is why every time that we see decks like this uh this riven god i keep fucking up the champions it's riven victor um you know, we see like these decks pop up every single season um and i it, it's so hard to give them too much credence because you expect them to just like disappear in a week. Um, and it feels like this one's doing unfair enough things that like it potentially is good enough outside of just a, um, you know, a faint climbing to rank one type of thing, right? Yeah. So, like, from watching it for a while, its descent has slowed. So, like, you probably remember when the stats had it at like a 63%. Oh, it's something just fucking like, stupid. Absolutely yeah. absurd. It declined relatively quickly into the 50s. And now it's like, drifting it's mostly just increasing play rate without losing win rate Mm -hmm. so it might be stable at this like 54 ish percent um there is like a systemic problem in the meta right now of like sundisk is just donating win rate to a million people where like this deck is seeing a ton of play and does not have the win rate uh, uh, to justify it you want the the monastery mahat take sure i think this deck is really fucking good I think people are just really bad at playing it. Like, uh, I would agree. <laughs> I think people need to quit dropping unleveled champions. It's it's as simple as that. Just play a little bit slower and only drop leveled champions. And I think it's dumb as fuck. 
I think it does genuinely unfair things. Um, and I think that it's a, a deck that's probably better than its win rate. Um, I would generally agree. I do think Sundisk is like one of these decks that uh, is going to have a lot of people with that opinion and a lot of people this deck is unplayable because I think what decks you play is going to change your opinion of Mato Shurima vastly. I think if, if you, you like your Aphelios... Like... Oh, go ahead. If you like your Aphelios, your Tribeam, your like slowish mid-range decks, you are going to get absolutely dumpstered by Mato Shurima. And if you like <laughs> just aggroing people out, this deck looks unplayable. I think once you once people start playing like normal fucking human beings and they just like, you know, instead of playing for this turn six flip, they're like, okay, what if I played like good cards and I played like triple quicksand and I just like slowed the game down a little bit and played more mid-rangey and just like flip my stuff naturally? Because like you're auto winning once you flip anyway, right? I, I there, feel like the deck becomes a lot stronger. There was absolutely an issue where people were playing the heavy predict version, which just sucked. Like, unequivocally, it was a bad deck. For um, sure. But at the same time, people still aren't on, like, triple quicksand for some reason. You need to be on triple quicksand. I yeah, get the, so many points on people just, like, not running triple quicksand. The deck has vastly improved. I do think most people are on two quicksand. I'd have to go, like, dig up stats on that. But... Mm -hmm. um, the decks people are playing that are Monoshirima have improved considerably, and so that problem has lessened. Although I don't think it's gone away. People are still playing worse lists than they could have been. I mean, I think some people are copying uh, CCY. I don't actually know who that is. Uh, but... I, I've seen them on Ladder. Um, I think Roji's but... new version with uh, it's running like two deny, one zillion, uh, some quicksands. It seems like it feels like we're getting like better versions, um, you know, every few days. Yeah, the Roji version, um, I think, is going to start to pick up because um, it wasn't Roji; it was Beast Llama in the rank one. Uh, so it was it was Faint, I think. I think Faint took. Oh, Faint uh, hit rank one. Yeah, yes. he took Roji's list and hit rank one with it. So I think that one's going to start picking up, particularly because Faint is such a popular content creator. So I think that one will pick up, and we'll see the win rates start to drift up. But yeah, I just hope that this deck stops donating win rate. Although, <laughs> the fact that it has such low win rate and such high play rate kind of implies that people like this deck because they like it enough to play it even when it kind of loses. So yeah. I think one thing that uh, I like to look at, so, you know, you talk about sometimes that it donates a ton of win rates. So when we're looking at like these, these main win rates, you know, if we're looking on like Runeterra AR or at the, the tableau here, um, you know, we're seeing these overall win rates. It's like, these aren't really indicative necessarily of this deck's overall power. If, you know, it's gaining, a, you know, a ton of win rate from like a 30% play rate Monoshirima. Um which yeah. is why, like, when I was responding to you, you know, I took a picture of, like, just the matchup table of Fizz Lulu. And I'm like, yes. yeah, it's farming Monoshirima, but it's kind of farming, like, everything else, right? Yeah. Yaya, I think, uh, obviously, it's great for, like, engagement to, like, take things out of context or something. I do think this deck is kind of problematic. My question is always, like, is Yaya the card the problem? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, Fizz Lulu wasn't an issue before then, right? The card Yaya? Yeah, before Yaya came out. Um, there wasn't really a deck in that Okay, so area. like, Lulu Jinx wasn't a problem before, right? It was pretty good for um, I, I, if, if pink literally yellow meta? two people play it, and it never I mean, sees any play rate, like, I don't know. <laughs> and there was like me, Broken Ball, and uh, Stolen Conch, the classic. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, I, I I agree. I I think you're helping out my point. <laughs> that was great. I don't know what people. It were certainly wrong. was a deck that existed, and like sometimes you know saw the victory screen. That is that is true. I had like an eighty percent win rate with this deck. It farmed the super yeah, auction. Yeah, it was so good. Win rate with this Aphelios deck too. I, <laughs> and I I bet if I asked you, you'd still tell me that TF Nami Shellfuck was a good deck. Hey, that deck on. was good. <laughs> no, nah, I think that deck was so fucking bad. <laughs> I okay. Here's how I know that deck was bad. Hidden Pathways nerf was enough to just completely wipe it from the fucking map. Come I played on. it in all. Way. I mean, it doesn't have TF anymore, so I played it. Yeah, yeah. I guess like it, it also got hit, 
it also like hit the shell folk nerf. And harpoon was the same patch, right? So there were there were a couple. Harpoon, shell folk, conchologist. Although conchologist uh, is still it, it open, happened a bit so. later. I don't think we can throw conchologist nerf on there. Um okay, here's here's decks that I think are broken. Okay, here's one that like people aren't really talking about yet, but I think we'll be talking about it soon. I think this uh this new FTR with ramp and she who wanders, I think this is an unearned in, uninteractive bullshit deck that it should see a lot more play rate than it does, and I think it's broken as shit. Um I don't know if I wouldn't go so far to call it broken immediately. I think this deck is quite strong and potentially broken. I so I think that like I think the power of Ravine um combined with six mana vengeance, uh four six trundle, um, and she who wanders. I think these things together uh just make stalling to like a she who win so much more uh viable than it should be. I think it's so much easier to get to that late game, which I at this point that late game's what, like turn eight? Um, and then just she who wanders and auto win against some decks. Yeah, it's I would definitely put this in this category of like, is this really the type of deck that you want to be good? Mm -hmm. um, but I don't even think it's like this specific feel the rush deck. I think feel the rush consistently has been this kind of like I think feel hey, the rush is a lot easier. Like I would much prefer like if it, if what we were worried about was like a turn eight FTR, like I'm down to fight through a turn eight FTR. I don't think that's like that big of a deal. But she who I think is such a it's a win con that's so impossible to interact with for so many decks that I just yes. I I am much less willing to give it a pass compared to like I, FTR. Yeah, I just think that like FTR has gone down that direction already. Because also, like to be clear. <laughs> When I'm talking about uh, this ramp deck, I'm not talking about peak. I think peak is bad. I think you just play like normal yeah. uh, Freljord SI. I just want to make sure. Um, you know, for yeah, it's, yeah, it's just like Feel the Rush with like Voices of the Old Ones and like some big dumb uh, Bale Strider cards. Like I've seen It That Stares and Buried in Ice and so Yeah, on. I think Buried into It That Stares is kind of fucking insane. That one is also kind of uh, questionable to have around. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think Buried and Ice is such a wild card and that, like, it was so bad for so long. But then, like, you know, 4LW made this Trundle Timelines deck that suddenly made it, like, good. And we're like, oh, wait, it's impossible to develop into this card because if you do, you lose the game instantly. And now, like, actual control decks are running it. It's just, I don't know. <laughs> it's it's scary. It is an experience, to say the least. <laughs> yeah. Um... But yeah, I think that's a problematic deck that's, like, on the horizon. I don't think that enough people have picked it up yet. Similar to, like, Fizzlulu. Dude, Fizzlulu has been around since, like, you know, fucking November. Like, there were BR players tearing up fucking tournaments all through December that, like, stopped playing the deck for, like, three weeks before the balance patch. And, I mean, my, yeah. my head cannon is that they were trying to make sure it didn't get nerfed in the, uh, the Ari nerf uh, patch. But, like, this deck's been around for a long time, you know? Yeah, one of the things that I... Uh, that like inspired me to try this like balance type thing was when they were talking about how like um, we didn't really notice that like yours and ours was a problem. So I was like, is that like possible? Can mm -hmm. you actually just miss this? Because like I felt like yours and ours was like so blatantly like uh, setting aside this argument of like, are you supposed to nerf the card or the deck? But like yeah. the deck has clearly been a problem for a while. Like that's unarguable. Um, and it's like, how did you miss this? Like, particularly, like, what stats could you be looking at? Like, were there any stats that you would miss this for? I, I think um, that there's a certain amount of... I don't know. I don't know when they're looking, like, how early they're looking at these things and, like, what they're missing out on. I mean, to be fair, I think that, uh, at least for me personally, I'm plugged into, like, you know, the whole tournament meta um, and like, I'm seeing a lot of these like high low decks that don't necessarily see a ton of like play rate. You know, if you're just scrolling through Runeter AR, you might not see, um, you know, like this, uh, this Fizz Lulu deck being a monster in like November or December, but I think it was then. Um, and yeah. if you're like a dev that literally just doesn't engage with the competitive scene at all, um, I, I could see like Fizz Lulu not like being a noticeable issue until like January, um, or February. 
But yeah, I mean, once we start looking at like these patches as being like, you know, eight to nine week things, it, it's really hard to see how they couldn't have noticed this. Yes. Uh, I think we've seen that like happen with more recent things where it's like, you probably were aware of Talia Ziggs long before it showed up. Oh, for sure. for sure. Because it showed up in tournaments. It was like a fairly common deck choice from uh, various Brazilian players. And it was fine. Like, I didn't see it and be like... It's been like deck... low-key for a while, right? Yeah, and like and now it's showing up on tier list because the deck is showing like a 34, 33, sorry, not 30, 54, 53% win rate. Uh, and so other people are like, learning that this deck is a thing that exists that I'm might pretty sure it's like hard riding 60 like last season like yeah it's, it's been putting up insane numbers with like a really low play rate for a long time yes yeah it's been around I mean since like Ziggs released did there anything come out like later parts um, of Vandal City where like that the deck needed? I don't think I so. I think it got built a little bit differently. Like, people are building it more, like, low to the ground. It was, like, an Arsenal deck before, and now it's not. It's, like, a Ziggs Burn deck that, like, sometimes uses the Arsenal, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, it's being built differently, and I think that there's, like, changes in the meta. Um, you know, it's, it's not, like, an unbeatable deck, uh, but it is unbeatable for some archetypes. And, like, the decks like Athelios coming back into the meta... Um, definitely help it out because it just kind of runs over most of Felios builds. Yeah, these like landmark decks really do a good job of. Uh, I actually like those types of landmark decks like Zeratzillion, um, Talia Ziggs. Uh, I'm sure there's other ones. Grandpa Roji, Talia Malphite. Um, mm -hmm. I like those types of landmark decks that are like these really overt hit you in the face to my landmark decks like Sun Disc and Tree, sure. where it's like. They do much of the same thing. If you can't reliably interact with landmarks, they kind of roll you, but they're more pleasant. I don't, even, I don't even know if like landmark interaction is enough to deal with stuff like Zigzilia or even Monoshrima. Like we, we see that with like Scorched Earth decks don't beat Monoshrima. They just don't. Um, and I think a lot of that comes down to uh, just the, the mid-range uh, value that you're able to generate out of uh, Devout. Um I think Devout's like a problem card, like a genuine problem card. Um, and I think that the fact that even if I like Scorched Earth, the landmark, uh, the fact that you still get a unit out of it is is really an issue. Um, that uh, just makes it impossible to push past this board. I, I think it gums up the board so well and then just value trades you. And it, it, so I, I don't know. I, like, I think Tribeam should be able to beat this fucking deck. And the fact that it doesn't is just absurd to me. I find the particular interaction of like the landmark from what like, I have no idea what the landmark is called, but like the devout landmark. Yeah. That yeah. you can't kill that. Um, I find that to be a pretty silly interaction. Um, I don't know. The way I've found success with handling it is just trying to keep this, like the devout permanently gravitumped. So it just never pops. Yeah. Anything. But yeah. that's like an absurd suggestion to try and say like, oh, this is how you handle you, you it. You put like, it in horny jail for 30 years and it can't attack. I I feel you. But I mean, you know, if you nerf, uh, if you nerf chompers, um, suddenly very few decks are beating this, by the way. Like a lot of yes. chompers decks are getting past it by just pulling it to the side. Once you have to engage with this card, it becomes an issue. And I think that the fact that you're able to just like throw a right of the arcane on it or throw like a naturalist on it and not have to worry about landmark removal, um, you know, really punishing you for it. It makes it so hard to actually interact with this deck. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I think the quicksand buff probably was a little bit premature. And now we're dealing with like a bunch of these, like, I mean, it's kind of a weird card. Kind of, kind of good. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> I think you can actually see, like, a lot of this with, like, Grandpa Roji's, like, particular distaste for Elusive, where, like, these Sharima mid-range decks had this, like, very clear weakness of just getting punked out by, like, yeah. Overwhelm, they had, Elusive. They like, no healing and, like, no way of interacting with Elusive decks. That's, like, that was the issue with Monoshrima before, was even if you could consistently flip on, like, turn 7 or turn 8, people were, like... This Emperor's deck is dog shit because, like, I took so much damage before and I just get burnt out even if I flip this. Right? Yeah. Nowadays, you have um, you have quicksand, and it's just like, oh, I actually don't have to engage with this. That's kind of the reason yes. why, at the beginning of the patch, my um, Biophelios was, like, crushing Monoshrima because I just, like, threw, uh, I just threw Overwhelm on Vi, and it's like, 
you're dead. Um, I am I am well familiar with throwing overwhelm on Vi from uh, Kyrie and some Parker Targon. Uh, so, <laughs> oh yeah, I missed that deck. I am very sad that that deck no longer exists. But I, I, uh, it, it exists in such a way where like it was never good, um, but still it was fun. You know, I want it. I, I love that deck because it existed in this range of I could play it to a fifty percent win rate in Masters Ladder, and that's all I actually want. That <laughs> that's fine. I I don't need to be able to bring this to tournaments and do well. I don't need to do well at Ladder. I just want to be able to play this deck and win some games. Yeah. Uh, also, I think the other issue with like Shrima is like we've kind of realized that Shrima has some insane protection tools. Um, having access to deny and hush and hourglass and like you can give a uh, spell shield to all of your champions and landmark at unit speed it's it's really hard to interact with them that like once they're doing something strong enough proactively uh suddenly it's like wait why do i have no answers why is this ionia with like a huge win con why is it ionia but also you have hush and also i can't kill you yeah I've seen, uh, there was a tweet by Majin Bay that uh, was like, this is what I woke up to this morning, and he's being attacked by like three oh, the Talia. 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 Yeah, yeah the triple <laughs> Talia, and like the Ziggs tree gets overwritten because we had too many DL2s on the yeah. stack already. Yeah, filling the stack is, that's yeah. a good mechanic I, that exists. I think that's a good example because like, I know what happened the previous turn. Majin was like, <laughs> okay, I need to interact with this Talia, so I'm going to thermo it, or I'm going to will of Ionia it. And their opponent said, well, I see you attempted to interact with me, so I'm going to hourglass this, and now I have three Talias. So fuck you and the horse you rode in on. Yeah. Die. I played my two-mana deny into my uh, five-mana fuck you, and now you are uh, very dead. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay, I mean, I'm okay with it being like, I'm going to try and interact with you. And you're like, well, I have the response. I have my hourglass. And you're like, okay, that's, like, useful, like, that's fair. You like punished me for trying to interact with you. And they're like, oh, by the way, not only did I punish you for interacting with me by beating you for two mana, you're just dead. Like, yeah. there's no living. I think the issue with Hourglass is that it is so empowering for Xerath, for Ziggs. Uh, they become like unkillable with like two mana denies, basically. Um, that also just like hardcore punish your opponent. I, I feel like this card is so strong in those archetypes that either like the interaction with the champion's abilities needs to be like changed a little bit. Um, I know that they updated uh, landmarks a while back so that like they sort of they don't resolve left to right actually with hourglass, right? They like sort of uh, they hang out in limbo until the hourglass pops and then it's like, okay, now I'm gonna. Uh, resolve these so that you get your Zerath procs, you get your Ziggs procs, right? Um, I mean, I, I, feel I like... get that, that. Oh, go ahead. I get that that's frustrating in the current situation, but I think that's better than like being this really annoying thing where like it's like the stupid star star spring like yeah. broadback protector dance where people would be like, okay, push these two into combat, pull them back so they're in the right order. Yeah, like, yeah. There's like so weird, dumb. you know, uh, ordering ordering like probably shouldn't be a thing on your back line, especially since you can like change it if you have combat token. Um, but like, I, I think the issue with it is like either that interaction that is so powerful, like needs to be changed, uh, which I think would feel bad. Like I think it would feel really bad. Uh, or this card needs to be slightly less efficient. I think it needs to not be two mana. Um, I could see an hourglass nerf. I mean, the problem that I see is like, we started this discussion basically being like, okay, Stats driven, what needs to be nerfed? Mm -hmm. And stats driven, I don't think Hourglass needs to be nerfed. Now, personally, I kind of agree with you. As like a person who plays this game, Hourglass is kind of a frustrating card. And I think it's like really annoying to deal with. But how much of that is just me being like, well, I don't find this an enjoyable experience <laughs> and I find this frustrating. Um, and how much of that is this is actually deserving of being nerfed? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I feel it. I, and maybe it doesn't, but I, I think that there's something problematic in, like, this mid-range landmark Shirima archetype. I, I, I feel like there's something problematic in there that needs a change. 
Um, but I, a lot of people, you know, hear me say that and they're like, yo, come on, Talia Ziggs isn't even that good. Bro, let us play it. Monoshreba is not that insane. Zarazillion, what deck is that? And they're like, are you really want to nerf Devout? I, I tweeted about Devout like a few days ago and like half the responses are like, bro, are we really complaining about Devout right now? And I'm like, I, I think that there's an inherent issue in here. And like, even if it's not necessarily borne out in the stats yet, um, I feel like it's there in a similar way that I think that the Scion nerf was based as hell and needed to happen, even if he had like fallen out of the meta. I agree. I think Scion was a card that should not have existed at 10 power because there were just so many games where your opponent plays Scion and seven and with 10 power, you're just dead. There's nothing. Yeah. Well, okay. You can play Targon. You can play Battle City. Or you can play <laughs> Idea. But like, those are your options. And you're like playing like for you, uh, let's say, like, you're playing, like, PNZ Noxus, your favorite Tribune deck. Your pub plays Scion. You're like, okay, is there a card in my regions that could solve this problem for me? And the best answer, I believe, was Defective Swap Bot. <laughs> I, that is a card that technically exists. I mean, the answer to Scion was, he comes down, you Mystic Shot him, you flock him in combat, and then you Stun Spider. That you had to trade three cards into it, this like perfect three card combo, um, and it ju it didn't it just didn't fucking work, bro. <laughs> uh, I'll discard my uh, survival skills for the my Draven Axe, yeah. so you could just take eleven instead. Yeah, or they'd start like killing him on the stack, and you no longer have a, a response. Like, oh, yeah, I don't know. There is um there is some shit, but I I think that's I think that it's, I I think. When we're talking about like stats and like stats based uh, balancing, I, I think that there are some things that are borne out in stats, um, and I think that there is value in there. But you know, similarly, you know, it's not necessarily part of this conversation. But I do think that there are some like side issues that you get from like feelings. Like I, I feel like this deck is a problem or will be a problem, or this interaction is a problem or will be a problem. Similar to like Nami, I think Nami does inherently broken things and is absolutely going to be a problem in the future. Like I agree. zero doubt in my mind. Yeah, when we were all talking about Nami nerfs, like prior to the Nami nerf, um, mm -hmm. I thought the problem with Nami was not that she flipped too quickly. It was the fact that Nami 2 just like killed you always. Like, yeah, it, it should be like a per turn value thing, right? Instead of like a, uh, I got three actions with Nami, so you lose the fucking game type thing. Yeah, I remember a game, uh, it was in Seasonals against Leovold. I remember this very specifically because... Uh, he got fairly salty, which is very fair. He did not, like, <laughs> salt at me or anything. Yeah. But I remember this where he's playing Tree, and I have a Nami in play. And um, he's at 18, I believe. I believe he's at 18. And I play a 2-1 Burblefish, and he plays Tree, and it's at 9 out of 10. It makes sense. I have Nami, Burblefish, and three cards in hand. And I go triple Spell Thief into Pokey... Um, <laughs> group shot, group shot, killing is one elusive, drawing two spells, casting two spells, and 20 him on the spot. Yeah. And we're just like, oh, yeah, this this seems reasonable. Yeah, I, I, I'm the person that's playing, like, TF Nami right now and saying it's broken. Or, like, I played Zoe Nami at Worlds. I qualified for Worlds with it. Like, I, 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 I think Nami just does insanely broken things in her current state. Um, and, you know, stuff like that. I, the Targon package was, like, a little bit silly. Um, but you do similar things in other packages as well, right? Which makes me think it's a Nami issue and not necessarily yeah. like anything else. Yeah, there's the photo. There's a screen cap from 4LW against, uh, what's it called? Uh, Alan, Alan CQ, mm -hmm. world champ. Uh, where like 4LW has like the 3-3, three, three, the like in, the one that looks at the top five cards and gives you a spell. Archivist, but, yeah. Archivist, yeah. Has an Archivist and an unleveled Nami. And Alan on turn four just vengeances the Nami, and that Archivist becomes a 19 power unit and like nugs him to one. And you're like, oh. it, it, it's fucked up. <laughs> it's like, which is why I think like that's what makes TF Nami so broken is that like it can really fork your opponent where it's like you have to answer my two mana unit. And if you don't answer my two mana Nami on site, you die. And even if you do answer it on site, Sometimes you die anyway. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. I don't there know. are some stuff that 
I think may simmer to the surface. I would not be surprised if Sharima mid-range simmered to the surface as a problem. I would not be surprised if Nani simmered to the surface as a problem. Um, maybe we go so far back that like Mountain Squire starts being a problem again because that was a problem at some point. I mean, at least Mountain Squire is like a two three. You know, <laughs> at least it's at least you're playing paying understat you're playing understated bullshit. Yes. Um, yeah. I don't know. And also. So like I, I think, uh, so another problematic card, I, I you won't hear me say it often. Another problematic card is shell folk, um, in a similar way to Nami, where like sometimes you point removal at it, and at burst speed you get so much value out of it that you it, it feels like you couldn't do anything about it anyway, right? You kind of yeah. Get that's fucked. that is something that I thought they should have been trying to fix with the nerf rather than like making it easier to kill, where it's yeah. like. I mean, the suggestion that I gave, which probably killed Shell Folk, if I'm being completely honest, it probably is not a good nerf for that, was like making the generated card fleeting. So it was like, you have to keep Shell Folk in play sure. to make dumb amounts of value. Sure. You don't get to like play Shell Folk, burst out value, fuck you and your vengeance. I think I think one thing uh, about Shell Folk is like prank to, um, prank being focus speed is really important to making it not like as abusive a card as it could be. Um, and similarly, if you, if we wanted to move other cards to focus speed, it would definitely nerf shell folk and like the amount of value that she can get by just existing on board for like one action. Um, but uh, at the same time, I don't know. It, it feels really bad if you play shell folk and shell folk has such a high, uh, deck cost. And I, people laugh at me when I say it, but genuinely, name a situation in which you actually want to main deck trinket trade, and you're not like doing some bullshit fizz thing or like some bullshit Tf Nami thing. Tf Nami shellfolk, no I, problem. I, I, I said <laughs> Nami thing, but yeah, no, it's it's such a bad card that like unless you're getting huge values from somewhere else for playing this inherently bad card, um, it's just it, it's. It's 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 really bad for you, right? I, I think similarly, like Shree Michelle folk, um, it's like an inherently problematic archetype that's only held back by not having a real win condition yet. Uh, the moment I would there's agree. a win condition, that card is, or that deck is not okay. Like genuinely, it's not okay. I remember at least three games against Double Line on Ladder that I scooped while thinking I was winning because I was just so done. I was like, I'm not interested in playing against Sharima Shellfolk. So. Have you seen the... I have, I have a new build of it that I think might actually be good. And I'm does scared. It, does it jerk off for five minutes and then not kill me? Because if so, I'm not so interested. It jerks off for five minutes and kills you. Um, okay, because maybe I'm interested. With the careful prep buff, um, you get so many copies of Ruinous Path and Pokey Stick um, and like Time Bombs. That it, it's very similar to the Akshan Infinite, in that like you just burn people out from on like zero mana, uh, from like ten or twelve, um, and it's really difficult to actually kill, right? Because you can play Shell Folk with like Scrying Sands, and any deck that cares about its board and cares about trying to push damage through board can't interact with you. You go into the damage step, and like suddenly you're fucked. Like I just actually, what if none of your stuff traded properly? And I drew 10 cards, and now you're dead, right? Yeah. Uh, you also get Quicksand. Quicksand is uh, newly buffed. I don't think I even have Quicksand in there, but, like, you definitely could run Quicksand. Like, there's so much protection. Oh, my God, an Hourglass? Okay, okay. So the thing is, people know that it's really good. So they shoot something at Shellfolk, and then I Hourglass it, and then I get actions. I get, like, first action on the next turn. It's... <laughs> It's fucked up, dude. It's really fucked up. <laughs> All right. Maybe maybe I'll try this at some point. Uh, it's the type of deck that, like, I i don't want to, like, scream it from the rooftops because I think this is a toxic as hell deck. Every time I link it in my chat, you have to give them the, the speech about, you know, great power comes great responsibility. Don't make this a terrorist deck because it might be a terrorist deck. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, there's problematic stuff like that that it, it's not an issue right now. But it might be, and it will be, like, at some point. Yeah. I think, like, it's easy to point at these things and say, like, these might be an issue at some point, but you're going to have something that feels overpowered. Like, even if we nerf, like, everything until, like, Shark Chariot is, like, too good for the meta. 
then are we gonna sit here and be like, my god, Shark Cherry is so mm-hmm. good. You have to fucking mini morph this card on site. I agree. I, I don't have necessarily anything against like um like uh power creep. I think power creep is kind of like a necessary evil in a lot of games, and especially in like card games where I I don't know if you how much you watch my stream, but I've talked a lot about um how what like people's response to the original Sharima release, I think uh, is really, really affected the way that Riot has released other regions since then. Like the way that Bandle has had like a lot of really strong staple cards to carry it through being, you know, slowly you know, like pieced out, piecemealed out. Um, you know, we saw stuff like yes. uh, Lecturing Yordle um, and Aloof Travelers um, and other cards like that being released at such a strong state because that's what they had to do with Shirima because Shirima was fucking unplayable on release. Yeah. Until, like, Sh- Treasure Seeker came out and, like, Merciless Hunter and Ruin Runner and plus three, plus one Shapestone. Until they had all these incredibly strong cards, the the region was unplayable and they received so much shit for it. And it feels like yeah. we're just, we're doing the whiplash back and we're like, wait, why is Bandle playable right now? That's the, in- the yeah. impression I've gotten in the past. I mean, frankly, I think, um, like, the three set release thing is, like, the actual problem of, like, why? Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> It kind of makes sense with these like champion expansions where like Aphelios comes out and we release Aphelios cards. And it's like, okay, I get this. Like, this makes sense. Or like, I guess for a better example, champ expansions would be like uh, the Viego Akshan release. Sure. Viego and Akshan release, they both get decks. It's interesting. It's compelling. It's fun. But like, this idea of like, hey, Shareem is going to release and you don't have Treasure Seeker. So your deck is just terrible because you don't have Treasure Seeker yet. It's like how. How like uh, Tristana wasn't a card until like the third set came out, right? Yeah, yeah. Tristana like doesn't exist until you get Fake Grandfather, and it's like, okay, what? Why was Tristana even in the first set? Like, yeah. yeah, what was the point? She's the teaser, um, you know. She's what keeps people interested, you know. <laughs> yeah, but like I don't know, release something else that cares about multi-region cards that's like a more interesting teaser than. Tristana, where you like look at this, and you're like, is this good? And the answer is no. Don't play Tristana. And then Faye Grandfather finally releases, and you can play it. So. Yeah, Grandpa Faye and Lantern, and I, I'm surprised that uh, the the three mana card that generates an Alcat and buffs every Faye in your hand. I'm surprised that's not played. I'm gonna be honest with you. I, I think there's like some insane combos that where you're dropping like five three Alcats uh, on turn four that it feels like it should be a thing. I mean, Mo thought the uh, Scout. Attach on a, some Fey was good. I don't think it was uh, good. I, I thought built, that it was I built Nar Ionia Fey Attach. Um, and the idea was that you got to run um, like Twin and Deny and Palm, but also like buffing attached cards like was just such insane uh, was just such insane value because like they kill the thing it's attached to and it's like, okay, well, I'm just going to play it yeah. back out because it just holds um, all the hand buffs, right? I strongly wonder if we're, like, ever going to have a problem where, like, I don't know, you have, like, Quick Quill, and, like, you just put a Destiny's Call on it, and you're like, okay, answer my, like, Lunari Duskbringer that is now an 11, 10. I don't know if, like, Destiny's Call is going to be the issue. I think it's more likely that something like uh, Mentor is going to be an issue, or Island Navigator, because it keeps the, it keeps the, the, uh, the discount. Like, if it pops back into your hand, it's yeah. cheaper forever, and it holds yes. on to the hand buff. I think yeah. there's something there. Yeah, the other one that um, the scout is kept around, thank God it doesn't work with the like, Tattered Banner. If yeah. it worked with Tattered Banner, that would have been... If you could actually run a real card instead of fucking field promotion. Yes, yeah. And then, um, what was the last one? I, thankfully, the, like, Freljord... Uh, Grant Overwhelm is an allegiance card, so you like can't oh, get yeah, Overwhelm on a fucking attach unit. Yeah, that would have been bad. Um, that would be super fucked up if you could keep giving yeah. like Overwhelm. Oh my god. <laughs> uh, like you've seen like double attack Roadrunner. How about I put unhushable double attack Overwhelm on like anything I want, and if you yeah. kill it, I get this back. Like, I think attaches interactions with like hush and quicksand and every other thing um, are just so unintuitive 
and so uninteractive and like uninteractive in a way where like you can't stop it like destiny's call onto a uh, rainbow fish might be a broken fucking combo in the future it's yeah. like you just can't uh, stop it i agree that like this seems questionable because like i don't know maybe you can like hush keywords off where it's like it makes sense where like you hush this thing and it loses keywords but you can keep the base stats from the attached unit yeah like i think that would be fine but like, but like that you st- you, you can't stop like elusive or double attack just feels like an issue yeah uh, i mean i don't know if that's actually more intuitive because like you would hush something and it would lose everything except for exactly plus two plus two from the uv and you're like yeah mm, I, but yeah i don't know i <laughs> this, the current situation does not seem like a good spot it's weird that the only answer to it is comment like, or in tomb. Yeah, like, why are these the only answers to attach? Yeah, there's other stuff that's like really intuitive. I don't know if you know this, but if you entomb a, a unit that is attached, yeah. the attached unit gets obliterated and yeah. doesn't come out of the tomb. Yeah, no, it's yeah, like if you entomb, like entomb's like a real counter to like the Yumi decks. Yeah, um, which it, it feels wild. And I know that. I know that the reason it goes back into your hand, like, the devs were like, you know, it would feel bad. It would kind of suck if, you know, your attached card, like, disappeared with your other card. And it's like, isn't that kind of the point, though? Aren't you, like, investing a lot of cards into your guy? And, like, the fact that you get it back for free and the fact that it doesn't lose any of its stuff just feels kind of weird. Yeah, I mean, I've certainly had that experience with, like, uh, Aphelios, where you just, like, you hit, like, Papercraft Dragon off of, like, Fey Aid. So now you have a 3-3 Papercraft. You're like, okay, Yordle Squire. And they're like, okay, that's a 2-1. I don't care about that. And you're like, well, now it's a 5-4 with double attack. So now you do care. And they're like, okay, What's really funny I'll kill it. Is I feel like people are bad at Aphelios, um, but also kind of, like, grief um, with, like, Yumi Pantheon. Because a lot of times, if I see you throw, like, your big attach unit, whether that's Yumi or the double attack or the elusive, onto a, a unit that's not like fizz or not pantheon and i can just put it in gravitum jail i refuse to kill that unit ever i don't want you to ever be able to reattach i want you oh, to just sit there and stare at it because like i can interact with that unit i can't interact with fizz right yeah i mean putting putting things in jail there was a that was a good farming engagement tweet that i got to make at the start yeah where... You just get to put Yumi in jail. Like Yumi goes on like Saga Seeker and she's just in jail now. She does not. Which is also why I said from the beginning that they need to just move to three cataclysm. And the fact that they still haven't yet, you know, they're like, oh, we'll play one or two cataclysms. It's like, no, I think you need to slam three if you're not banning Thelios. Yeah. Um, I've seen lists of three to say the least, but I don't know how frequent that is. If I was playing Pantheon, I would play three cataclysm and not look back at this latest. Yeah, you've seen List with three, just like you've seen, um, just like you've Draven, seen. Draven, uh, not Draven. Raven Victor, Victor, Victor with Baboon? Yeah, I have. Okay, okay. You talk about capture? I, I, I don't know, capture is such a weird thing, because I've literally never seen it be playable other than Tom Kench. I would um, actually like that mechanic to be good. It just isn't. I don't know if it like, would be toxic or not. I just haven't played against it. Like... I well, know. I feel like I feel like these kind of like mid like if you made like these kind of mid tier champion not champions mid tier cards like have a catch where like I don't know you have a two four for three that captures a unit with three or less power or something where it's like it comes down it provides a big board swing right now but if your opponent kills it they get the unit back yeah I don't know that sounds like compelling interesting gameplay maybe it's overpowered maybe it's not but at least that sounds like interesting. Sounds like something that I'd like to I think engage it definitely with. could be cool. I think that, like, the Tom Kench use of it is bad. I think it's really bad. I think if it were, like, a tempo thing, um, I think that's good. If it's a, I'm putting your thing in jail, and you have to be able to kill my Tom Kench through, like, Astro Protection, like, I think that's, you know, some silly. I think, I think TK Rock is one of the worst design decks in the game. It's um, toxic as hell, and the, it, we're only saved by it having insanely polarized matchup tables that, like, makes it unplayable on ladder. I think people, like, there's a lot of people who get frustrated at TK Raka and look at it and they're like, oh, this deck is, like, unbeatable, where, like, you just can't do anything. 
And the answer is just to stop like pretending that you're actually playing a two player game and just like you're playing against the Nexus. Never interact with any of their units, never attempt to do anything with any of their units. Just kill them and ignore everything that they're doing. Yeah. It works much better. And also, like, the very fact that that is my suggestion is absurd. Like, you're basically saying, like, hey, you know this two-player game? What if it was a one-player game? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's um, I, I think it's very similar also to, like, Monastrima, where I think Monastrima has, like, this inherent issue where champions can flip in hand. So the, the fact that you can't interact with them uh, is going to be an issue when people get better at this deck. Similarly, like, Tom Kench Raka has this thing where, like, Tom Kench is a broken fucking card that is saved by people being stupid enough to actually cast his card. Like, just just don't yes. cast it. Like, yeah, just yeah. hold your opponent's mana hostage literally forever. He's a control card, not, like, anything else. Yeah, the only time I thought Tom Kench was, like, an interesting card to have around was the Aphelios TK deck, which, mm -hmm. like, only existed because you wanted to play your Zoe somewhere else and you wanted to play your TF somewhere else. So you were oh, playing I still think Tom TK Kench. Nami was the way to go, by the way. I think that deck was really good. I played against Boulevard in a scrim once and destroyed it with Zoe, and I was like, okay, this deck cannot be worth it if it doesn't beat this. <laughs> I think if it drew Tom Kench, it was so insane in the mirror. Like, it was auto-winning mirror. Um, the issue is if you don't draw Tom Kench, like, it was kind of bad. Like, Zoe's probably better in, like, most other instances. But, yeah. yeah. I mean, the point of the lineup was that you got to play, like, Zoe Lee, right? Yeah, Which, yeah you like, got to play Lee at the same time. It did make sense to me where you're saying like, okay, I want to play like Zoe, I want to play, Z I want to play Nami, and then I want to play Lee. So, what's the next best champion I could possibly play in this deck? And it's probably Tom Catch. Yeah, and TK being like a weird uh, mirror breaker is, is like an interesting thing, but that card, I think Tom Catch is really toxic with Astral Protection. I think Astral yeah. Protection is kind of an issue. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's not like that different than Bastion, so. Um. Um, I mean, okay, okay. So to be clear, I don't think Tom, I don't think Astral Protection is that bad because you're playing four mana for like no attack stats. It's just your shit doesn't die, which like is maybe fine, but like I don't know, bro. There there hap there's some decks that literally just can't interact with like Tom Kench with Astral Protection on it. I mean, it's like faded the card, right? Your damage based removal doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Where it's like, at least Bastion, you can like pop it, right? I think Bastion's a lot healthier than Astral because Bastion is like generally good. It's like a solid, like, I mean, it's probably not an 8 out of 10, but it's like generally applicable, does stuff across the board. Whereas Astral Protection is like, oh, you're doing this one particular thing? Get fucked. You're yeah. not doing that one particular thing? Okay, I don't do anything. I think that's Whereas the thing like, is like, Bastion stops one interaction. Whereas Ash Protection's like, fuck you, you're never killing this. You know, you have to throw, like, five cards at this fucking thing. With damage, though, it's like, if your opponent plays a Vengeance, the card just doesn't oh, yeah. do anything. Which is, like, more frustrating to have around, where it's like, if you're playing damage, like, Ash Protection is, like, so absurd. Whereas if you're playing Vengeance, it's, like, not a card. I think one perspective that maybe I'm limited, and that I view a lot of Legends of Runeterra balance through decks like uh, Tribeam, and like Shen Jarvan, uh, like Sivir maybe, like these mid-range decks that feel very fair in how they interact with the game. Um, in terms of, you know, they're they're trying to take advantage of like the combat step or like tempo or like damage-based removal, which I feel like should be healthy things within the game. And I, I think that I interact with and I experience a lot of other decks through this paradigm. And, then, you know, when I see stuff that's like inherently breaking that, um, that's when I feel like it's kind of broken. Yeah, I do think we should be trying to keep decks like uh, Shen Jarvan. Like, when Shen Jarvan is the deck that people are complaining about, I think you're in a good spot. Yeah. And I think Tribeam generally falls in that category. I would just, like, particularly critique the card Tribeam. Uh, yeah. The rest of the deck is fine, but, like, there's some there's games where it's like... Go ahead. There's some games where it's like your opponent started with two copies of Tribeam in their opening hand and you're just dead to rights. There's nothing you can do. It's like, There's definitely okay. like value trades later on that just become an issue that you can't really deal with. Um, but yeah, I think like... I think the the issue with Bandle City was best uh, looked through through the lens of decks like Shen Jarvan and Ashnox where like they can... They were like playable before Bandle. 
um, they were like solid. Like I topped a seasonals with them. Yeah. Um, and the issue is that afterwards they w- were playing very fair value games where they were trying to gain value on board by trading like one for one, but keeping their unit one for one card wise, like in your hand, right? Like combat tricks. Um, and then like they built up like incremental advantages on board uh, that just eventually turned into me pushing damage through to you or you just running out of cards. And the issue is that Bandle just inherently broke that. There's so much value generation in the game right now that something like Shen Jarvan trying to like grind you out on board or like Ash Knox like trading a brittle seal for your unit suddenly doesn't matter. And like suddenly you can't gain enough of an advantage that you're just like you're doomed. Yeah. Remember when our, our value generator was fucking River Shaper, bro? Like, come yes. on. Yeah. I, what's it called, um, I know you didn't like the deck and didn't think it was good, but I think that was, like, very exemplified with, uh, Shellfolk and Nami yeah, TF. Yeah, it just because too much. You would just, you would just generate random bullshit units, buff them up to be, like, kind of relevant, trade them off, and then you would just end up, like, up five cards. And your yeah. opponent's just like, my fucking, like, screeching dragon traded with an octopus. what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is why I, you know, I, I had been preaching that uh, Bandle was an issue for a long time. And I, I had been playing to, like, I think Conchologist it was, like, a fucked up card. Um, just because it broke the value game. You know, it trades into everything. It generates a card in hand. Uh, it does insane things. Um, and I don't know. I, I think that the game has shifted in such a way where, like, we generate so much value nowadays. Sign-in is a card um everything every deck generates like tons of value or has like an insane solitaire game plan uh that just like blows you out and combos you out that's something like shen jarvan or ash Knox just has so much trouble unless you know ash Knox leaning into like uh you know like an otk might be the way to make it good or like if you want to fix ash Knox, like buff assessor right hey, give they them their you, own value they printed you a new card there's that like terrible overwhelmed wolf that spawns another wolf you get two whole cards What's funny is that card isn't even that bad. It's just, it, it doesn't do enough. <laughs> when it comes out, it's it's kind of cool, but it's just, yeah, like, it, like, who cares? You know? Yeah, and on, like, three wolves, and then, I don't even know, like, you have to, like, you get a 1-1 one, one if you frostbitten one thing, right? Yeah, it's it's a den mother, so it summons, like, like a 4-4 four, four or 5-5 five, five or something like that, and then it summons the second thing with Overwhelm that, like, you know, if you frostbitten, like, 10 times, then it's, like, an 11-11 or some shit. Yeah, that, I don't know, that can't be good. Like, yeah. I don't even know how you fix that. I, I think, like, the way that you fish Ash no- fix Ash Knox is, like, hmm, I think if you buff Assessor to 5 attack, that's drawing you more cards, which means that you can value trade more. Um, and, like, Ash should probably just start out the turn with the arrow in her hand. She shouldn't have to draw it. No. Because it's so clunky, and it slows you down in such a way that, like, you know, take away the draw 1 on it, just, like, generate it in your hand. You know? Yeah, this goes back a really long time, but I wish like Omen Hawk was a two one. I think that could go a long way for supporting these like board based failure decks that don't yeah. want to play Avalanche. But I, don't know, I kind of maybe. hate Omen Hawk because of like the potential high rolls. It is not a card that I think you really hope to have good because like Omen Hawk hitting like Assessor is very different than Omen Hawk hitting like. Trifarian glory seeker, the five one yeah. camp block. All right, assessor, but like also even in like the Nar Darius deck, it hitting Nar right now is pretty good. Or it yeah. hitting the uh the three one with tough, um it kind of saw... a four to a tough's like, oh fuck. Yeah, I saw someone playing like Nar attach Fey stuff. And like they played an Omen Hawk and then played a four four lantern on turn three, and I was like, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I cannot remove that. Yeah, plus one, plus one becomes really insane on some units. Yeah. I don't know. Right? See, but, like, when we talk about... When I talk about, like, Ash Knox and, like, the way to fix it, like, my answer is, like, give it more value and, like, let it draw cards so it, like, is sort of brought into the new age um, of, like, what decks do nowadays. And I, I don't know if that's the direction we need to go is because it feels like an arms race where like everybody has to have like X amount of value to be playable. Um, so like every yeah. single Demacia Frailer deck that I ever see, I laugh at. I know that I'm never losing a game into that unless they have like, you know, unless like Galio wins the game on coming down. 
because they just they can't generate value. Like I could just eventually outgrind them. You know, they aren't doing crazy enough things for me to actually worry about. Yeah, I think I don't think you talked about power creep previously. I don't think power creep is inherently wrong, but I think we've gotten to this point in power creep where like you have to generate cards to be viable. Mm. And if we want people to be able to grind people out of cards, we just grind them out and win the game that way. You're going to have to just do systemic nerfs and not compensate, not compensate with buffs. You have to lower the power level if you want to get back to that style of gameplay. And if you want that style of gameplay, there is no other way. You have to do that. Which is wild and, because I, I feel like Ari Cannon, um, we remember Ari Cannon. Ari Cannon was like really fucking strong, kind of the best deck, the best thing you could be doing like far and away. Um, but I feel like the power level of Ari Cannon and the power level of the other decks at the time of Ari Cannon was much lower than like if we look back to Worlds. Um, like Ari Cannon being your best deck um, compared to like at Worlds, we were doing stuff with like Zoe Nami and like Scion with Challenger, uh, the the thing that kept coming back, the Lost Soul. Yes. Um, you know, Poppy. Like the power level of decks is going like up and down in such a way where like I feel like Ari Ken was like a pretty okay deck to be the best deck of the format. Um, I don't know I... because I I just I feel like going just looking back it doesn't it doesn't feel like it was doing stronger things than like decks we were dealing with like three months before yeah i did not find the Ari cannon situation to be as frustrating as some of the other vandal city situations that were just immensely frustrating to have mm -hmm. around um i mean i took a break last meta because i found tree and like the fey pile and pantheon to just be absolutely miserable experiences to have around for but, sure yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's weird. I because I, I assume that I I haven't been ultra engaged with other card games before, at least competitively. Um, you know, I'd followed like a little bit of Yu Gi Oh before, but not really. Uh, so when I'm seeing stuff like um, I don't know, like like the power levels of cards or the power levels of the decks, like going up and down, or like the the increase in like just across the board value has gone up a lot in the last couple months. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know how to react to it or how we should move forward with it. Yeah. Fixing like fixing power creep kind of implies that it's a problem that needs to be fixed. And I don't even know if that's true. It's just kind of like power has been crept. Are we you know, happy with it? It's just Are like we not? Thing that I don't know. Um, I think like there's something to like. I think there are some like very clear problems of like these decks or like these people who are tied to decks and particularly like them. Power creep is particularly frustrating for. I mean, for sure. uh, the person who comes to mind is Random Seven with Deep and Karma Azrael. Both those decks have just been power crept out of existence. You cannot play them and have a successful win rate. And it's, like, sad for random. Like, I suppose random can go try and find some other deck to play the way he played Deep and Karma Ezreal. Mm -hmm. But is that something that is, like, reasonable to ask of people? Of, like, your deck doesn't just become, like, not the best thing. Your deck is, like, outright not viable. Yeah. I mean, Deep... Is Deep that far out of the meta right now? I mean, have you ever played Deep and gotten your Nautilus aloofed? Okay, true. Aloof? Aloof? Aloof is fucked up. I, uh, I think aloof is fucked up. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know. Yo, Lippy, thanks for the follow. Deep has okay matchups into the meta, I think. It still beats things. It's still, like... Deep does this thing where it just, like, checks you on a certain turn. It's like, hey, can you deal with um, with Nautilus plus developing, like, several different things um, you know, on this one turn? You know, can you deal with this board? And if you can, then they're like, yeah, fuck them. They lose. But if you can't, like, it can be a very difficult deck to deal with. You know, it's just like a check. It's like a, it's like a benchmark thing, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't think Deep is, like, completely unplayable. I mean, there's been... There's been decks that have been like essentially deleted, um, and deep isn't I'm quite sure that bad. 
Shen Jarvin's in a much worse spot than Neep, I think. I mean, I think Shen Jarvin isn't like the worst example of that. Like Fiora Shen, like Alan's dead. I mean, fuck Fiora though, right? <laughs> fuck Fiora. That card was probably not the wisest design. Yeah. It's wild because like Fiora Shen feels like it existed in such a different time. Because I look at this deck and it's like, okay, so we were playing like six mana Scythria, some Screeching Dragons, um, and like nine mana Brightsteel. And it's like, I, how the fuck were these games getting to this point where like, A, you could play a nine mana Brightsteel. How are you winning games with like Scythria the Bold? How is Scythria really just like winning you this game? I don't know. It's, it's weird. Fiora just like warped the game in such a way that it made, I don't know. It, fuck Fiora. Old metas are like you look back on the decks and you're like, I I don't understand how this deck won a game. Yeah, uh, I, some of them you can, you know. I'm mean, Fiora Shen or existed at the same time as you know, Tia Fizz and Aphelios. How do you feel about Aphelios getting buffed? By the way, I think that was a mistake. Um, I still stand by that. Like the way to actually buff Aphelios was send Moon Weapons back to two mana, but increase his cost, give him yeah. some stats to compensate, and basically be like. You can do this dumb moon weapon value train. It just has to start later. You yeah. cannot. You cannot start spamming moon weapons on turn two. Get out. Uh, turn two. Turn three. Get like, out of here. If we talk about value being like this thing that's inherent to decks now, like you know card generation or like draw constantly, um, as being something that's sort of been upped, you know, as we have gone along, it feels like Aphelios just like exacerbates that issue. Aphelios generate so many cards and they're so good and they're so mana efficient that like it's like doubling down on it right yes i mean double stuns on big units calibrum breaks the paradigm of one mana for one damage does yeah. three damage um crescendum is like random units that are fine and like even Severum, like i think infernum is probably like the worst weapon but Severum like pulls some heavyweight and infernum isn't even that bad like as a token Infernum's fine. You've never main deck it, but it's fine. Um, it's and like it's crazy because I feel like once people get good at Aphelios, right now I think people are like relearning it. If you watch some people play, I watch a lot of streams. I don't know if you know that. I watch a lot of people play yeah. a lot of games. Um, I watch people play Aphelios, and I, I feel like once people like get better at Aphelios, they start realizing that like Severum and Infernum are like pickable cards, and they're really yeah. fucking good. Severum is criminally underpicked in my opinion yes it's I would so agree. fucking good you can tell when someone has played enough of failures against aggro when they set up severum into an infernum and say fuck your noxian fervor i'm getting my life steal like severum into infernum when they're at like 13 hp you know it's not when they're like you know 4 hp and they're like oh fuck i have to get this through it's like no i'm just gonna like heal a little bit early and like you can't deal with them I mean, you know or like you know if you're say theoretically in a Master and Terror tournament, um, and your opponent has, like, you know, Ziggs that's going to, like, burn you out. Um, you know, maybe in that instance, Severum would be pretty good to get some healing. That way you don't die in the next turn. And theoretically, of course. Not, you know, just weird yeah. example. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had, to, I had to throw a shot up. <laughs> 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 but no, I, I do think, I think Aphelios is a mistake. Yeah, I mean, I actually like the card, and I would like to have it around. I just think that, like, at three mana, three mana is not the right mana cost for this card. And he's, it should be he's incredibly fun. Expensive. Incredibly fun. Yes. Um, I love playing him, and he's incredibly strong. But dear God, playing against him with a deck that isn't, like, built to beat him? Aphelios exists in another fucking game from, like, some <laughs> of these cards. I mean, you'll see these things of, like, I think Aphelios is actually an example. It's like, why the hell is this deck playing Aphelios? What? <laughs> Faye Aphelios should not be running Aphelios. <laughs> it's really good in that deck, but, like, frankly, I think, like, the reason is Aphelios is just so absurdly cracked that it's good in this deck, but... Aphelios is the gnar <laughs> in that, like, he literally elevates every deck that he touches. Yeah, um, uh, he's pretty insane. <laughs> yeah. It was just so cool. I mean, uh, people deluded themselves into thinking, like, the Zoe Aphelios with Sharima deck was good. That deck was not good, but people I thought mean, it was. They got to play Aphelios. I mean, they did get to play Aphelios. Aphelios. Aphelios does too many things. Why is Aphelios a tempo card and an infinite value card? What's up with that? 
And it kills your opponent. Like <laughs> He's so good. He's, He's so very good. good. Yeah. Um, we've got on for a while. Is there anything else you want to touch on? I don't want to like hold you forever. I don't think so. We've been on a bunch of tangents, and I should probably get to bed. But okay. Well, I appreciate you hanging out. Um, yeah, I appreciate you explaining through. I'd like to see people uh try to engage with like the stats and engage with like balance uh, in a different way. Just because you know when we we're just you know a, a few days after the patch complaining like we normally do, or you know on patch note day. Um, you know, complaining like we normally do. I like that we're taking a different approach. It's like this is a more proactive look to be like, what exactly could we be doing right now? It's like this, assumedly the same info that Riot's looking at. Yeah, I, I think they do have some stats that I would really like access to. Of like, I presume they're looking at like quit out rates. Swim likes to talk about this, where it's like, okay, I play against Cyan. How often does the person just close the clock? Um, that. Stat actually sounds very salient of like how frustrated are people with this deck. Um, and I don't really have access to stats like that, and that'd be interesting. Um, something else of like specific stuff is like, okay, are these like cards like Broadwing on two? Or like actually a better example, Legion Rearguard. Is Legion Rearguard on turn one with token like a 70% win rate opener? Probably because if so, I, I don't think so. I think Real quick, you know, Jason Sational, thank you so much for the raid, buddy. I really appreciate it. We have Drizoth on the line. We've spent the last couple hours talking about balance um, in Legends of Runeterra. Uh, I appreciate you guys all coming in. We're wrapping up a little bit. Do you really think Legion Rearguard on one is, like, the strongest opening? I think it's probably pretty high up there in terms of win rate. I think it's going to be well above 60% with Rearguard on one with token. Into some matchups, I think so. Like, into some decks that can't do it. I, I, you know me, I play a ton of Shell Folk. So if my Otter can't trade into you on turn one, or if I can't Thermo you on turn one, I hate your card that you're playing on turn one. <laughs> but I, I don't know yeah. if the rear guard's an issue, you know? So, like, the thing is, like, in some matchups, it's not going to be a big deal. If you play rear guard on turn one into, I don't know, Nightfall. Nightfall has a million two ones for one. There's That's no right. way that thing is fucking If you can trade into... <laughs> Rear guard? Oh my god, you won the game. <laughs> like, actually. Yeah. So, like, there's going to be plenty of decks that are going to be fine into turn one rear guard with token. But on aggregate, if you play a rear guard on turn one, what is your win rate? And, like, Pirates right now is a 55% win rate deck. Um, rear guard on one with token is their strongest opener. Probably. How frequently does their strongest opener convert to a win? And I think you're definitely north of 60%. It might be north of 65%. And I'd be really curious to know that stat. I wish that Pirates and, like, Plunder weren't the Bilgewater decks that ended up being good. I'd prefer, like, I, I like TF, Bilgewater, like, aggro mid-range decks. I want those to be good. I don't want, like, Crackshot crack shot Corsair bullshit to be what's good. I got a little bit of pushback on Twitter for this. This isn't really a stats-driven opinion, but I think Nox's aggro has gotten a little bit out of hand. And it's gotten to the point where you have to have specific anti-aggro tools to handle it, or you have a problem. So, And you, the pushback I got, you were some of it, where it was like, Scouts is fine in aggro. I, I just saw you say that Scouts was like 50-50. It's like, nah, bro. Scouts was shitting on aggro last patch. I was definitely wrong with what I thought. Tribeam was the I, other thing I that people thought. I respected a lot of you for, you know, just just hit me with the you were wrong. Like I, that's you know, a hell of respect. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I was wrong. I thought it was close to fifty fifty, but I was definitely wrong. I think but Tribeam's a really big one because I agree with you. Because if you remember back to Draven Ezreal, running like House Spider in that deck was not common. It was like a tech choice that you sometimes did going into worlds. I remember, like, wanting to put more house spiders in because of, like, Ping City. Like, specific aggro yeah. stuff like that was, like, I have to run house spider, otherwise I'm going to get run the fuck over. Um, and, like, nowadays, everyone's like, yeah, just slam three house spider into, like, everything. Um, and that's just, like, commonplace. That's just, like, expected. Yeah, I think aggro, it just feels like this, like, um, I the Dragon Crescendo nonsense prior to the Crescendo change, where it was, like, okay... You need to like play this to beat up aggro because you just cannot beat aggro without this like incredible hammer that bodies them. Well, and I feel like aggro has just gotten like a little bit out of hand for like normal decks to manage. 
I don't, I don't know if aggro has gotten too insane. I think, uh, so like realistically, the way to beat aggro is racing aggro. Like the moment you force them to block, you've won the game. Um, and more often than not, that's how you like win against them. You know, if you try to like go to like turn 12 against pirates or spiders, they're going to draw the burn eventually to just kill you. You need to be ending the game. Which is why, like, people didn't believe me when I said, like, Glorious Evolution, Shellfolk, like, beat aggro and beat, like, Ziggs Poppy. And it's because I killed them on turn seven. Um, I don't know. It, it's really interesting in that, like, Noxus aggro will eventually just, like, burn you out. It just will. Um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know how I, to also, solve it, but it's like... Time, just real quick. I mean, I know that, like, in Ari Kenan, you were, like... Bro, we need to play Eye of the Dragon and like uh, gifts. I'm like, bro, just kill him though. <laughs> I did eventually come around on that, and I stopped doing that nonsense. But it was exciting for a time. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It's like Lurk beats Aggro. I mean, Lurk is very similar to Aggro, and like the way that you beat Lurk isn't like trading one for one and trying to value them down. Because eventually Lurk's going to fucking kill you. Because, like, they start dropping things on, like, 9 and 10 and 11 that you can't deal with. Um, the way that you beat Lurk is putting Lurk on a clock. It's literally just like aggro. You have to put these decks on a clock because eventually their game plan will just... You just will run out of shit to answer. Then what? Sorry, I was... But yeah. Is there anything else you want to go over? I don't think so. I think I'm good. I appreciate you coming on. Um, that was, was fun. fun. Yeah. Uh, do you want to shout yourself out to the homies if people don't know uh, who Drizoth is? I am Drizoth. I am the person who uh, got Ikado into World's Finals by losing to him. <laughs> or not Finals, but Top Cut. So. Yeah. Uh, if people want to follow you, where do they follow you? I am on Twitter at, at Drizoth, which is there. You can see a very uh, fun picture of me and my cat. Which, you know, I mean, real talk, Sigmund is half the reason to follow Drizoth on Twitter. He gets correct. some Yordle and Arms Apologia mixed in with pictures of Dr uh, Sigmund, his cat. Which is This Sigmund. is an excellent photo. <laughs> this is beautiful. <laughs> hmm. All right, well, I appreciate you hanging out, bub. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on. Yeah, for sure. Have a good night. You too.